Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 9328 in the name of Patrick Harvey on active travel transformation. I'll allow a moment or two for benches to reorganise. Those who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak button now. On Patrick Harvey to speak to and move the motion up to 15 minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to do so. Uh, and I'm opening this debate at what uh, feels like a bit of a critical moment for active travel in Scotland. As you know, walking and cycling uh, are always my preferred ways of getting about, so I know firsthand the many benefits of active travel. But I also see every day places in my own community and across Scotland where it needs to be made easier and safer. In this role as a Minister for Active Travel, it's been a genuine privilege to be able to help bring those benefits to other people. Maybe the most impactful is when I meet young people who've been helped to get access to a bike for the first time or to gain the skills to maintain it and safe routes to use it. The independence that this gives them, the freedom to go where they want, when they want, without cost and without hassle, this is surely worth at least as much as the health and environmental benefits. So I found this role incredibly fulfilling, and I want to take time to acknowledge some of the progress that we've made so far in this session of Parliament. I've spoken before about the experience during lockdown, how in the midst of otherwise dire circumstances, many people discovered their own neighbourhoods anew through walking, wheeling, and cycling. But hanging on to that benefit in the longer term was never going to happen by magic. It requires investment to transform our built environment to support active travel. So we've committed record levels of funding with just under £190 million in our budget for active travel in this financial year, well on our way to £320 million by the year 2025. And we've helped to deliver flagship projects like the bridges in Stocking Fields and Sight Hill in Glasgow which bring together communities, bring communities closer together with connections uh, and opportunities. Less headline grabbing, but no less important, we've also been improving what we've already got, like providing £14 million to extend and improve the national cycle network. Removal of over 200 barriers uh, over the year has helped make the network's routes more accessible for everyone choosing to walk wheel or cycle along them. Uh, and these small measures can have a big impact for people who use the network, making everyday trips safer and more convenient. A giveaway. Liam Kerr. Can we have... In a different you? part of the Minister's portfolio, he's quantified the, heat, the cost of uh, doing what we want to in heat and buildings as £33 billion. What does he quantify the cost of, of doing all we want to do in the active travel space? Minister. Well, the, the cost that we've committed to is £320 million, or at least 10 per cent of the, the transport budget by the year 2024-25. Uh, over the longer term, I think the sky's the limit in terms of the transformation that we could make in communities uh, right across Scotland. And as we take that work forward, inclusion needs to be at the heart of our active travel policy, not just creating better infrastructure, but working to close the mobility gap and meet the diverse needs of a diverse community. One example is the work of our delivery partners, Cycling UK. They've formed a partnership with Spinal Injury Scotland to develop a fleet of accessible and adaptable e-bikes that let people with spinal injuries and other mobility issues participate in cycling every day on journeys that many cyclists would take for granted, just going to the shops, commuting to work or attending an appointment. We should not accept uh, that accessibility issues mean that someone can't make an active travel journey. In contrast with the priorities that held for so many decades, walking, wheeling and cycling are at the top of our sustainable travel hierarchy. And this, in turn, informs our priorities for investment uh, and policy decisions. 
So I'm again funding the Ian Finlay Pass Fund this year, named after the former Chief Officer for Pass for All, who tragically passed away in 2021. The fund supports small local projects to make improvements to existing walking infrastructure and make connections where there are gaps in local path networks. And I'm pleased to be able to announce today the launch of the £1.5 million Active Nation Fund. This fund will make grants of up to £200,000 available to a range of public, third and community sector organisations looking to scale up successful behaviour change interventions, enabling people to drive less and to walk, wheel or cycle as part of their everyday short journeys. This is only a, a narrow sample of the wide range of activity across Scotland that's already happening. And a lot of that work is still in the pipeline, and I can't wait to join with thousands of other people in seeing the benefits. But there are already positive outcomes from that rising investment. To take just one example, a scheme funded through our Places for Everyone programme, Garskewed Broad in the northwest of Glasgow, resulted in a 300% increase in the number of cyclists using the road, demonstrating the demand that there is for safe spaces and connected routes. And just last week, research funded by the Scottish Government showed that the levels for children walking, wheeling and cycling to their schools are now higher than pre-pandemic levels, with almost 50% of pupils getting to school actively. We're still... Yeah, I'll take another intervention. Graeme Simpson. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. I'm interested in he mentioned schools. Um, he'll be aware that uh, often at uh, primary school, um, kids do cycle uh, to school, but that tails off when they get to secondary school. Uh, what is he noticing now? Is that changing? Minister. I think we have a huge amount to do, not just in terms of infrastructure so that those routes are safe, but so that those young people have access to a bike, access to a different bike as their needs change as they grow, and access to the skills that they need to maintain them as well. There's a huge amount that we need to do. We are still in the early days of becoming an active travel nation and even the most ambitious projects that we begin today can take a few years to bear fruit but I'm determined to see our commitments uh, and record funding translate into real changes on the ground. In leading European cities like Utrecht and Copenhagen these sort of projects are commonplace and every day they're almost unremarked upon they're just business as usual, but they didn't happen overnight. They took decades of persistent commitment across political and funding cycles, and they took an appreciation that increasing active travel also isn't just about what we do with active travel policy itself. Just as much importance lies in how we manage wider transport policy, so our work on 20 mile an hour speed limits and traffic reduction targets, uh, in, in just a moment, as well as economic development policy, how we plan, build and use our places, so the role of our new NPF4 and the commitment to 20-minute neighbourhoods. That kind of sustained and integrated approach is becoming commonplace in other European cities too, uh, places that uh, some people might not typically associate with active travel, like Paris, Barcelona and Ghent. We can see our European neighbours transforming and reimagining their cities, and that's what we want to do here as well. I give way. Brian Whittle. Very grateful for the Minister for giving way, and I know he recognises I also have an enthusiasm for giving people the opportunity to be active and, and for active travel. But would he recognise that in the cities he's discussing, they already had a significant uh, active travel infrastructure that we don't have, and we are starting from a lower bar, and we must get uh, put more investment into delivering that active travel network before we can get people on, uh, to, to deliver on that. Minister, and well, it is that's currently precisely the case. why we are delivering record investment in this area. But I, I would make again the, the case that places like Paris and Barcelona perhaps didn't have that strong track record that coming from that higher starting point that he's talking about uh, in the way that perhaps Amsterdam or Copenhagen have been doing for longer. But where cities have achieved this change, they don't only get a health and environmental benefit. They find that once their communities become safer and more pleasant places to spend time in, they thrive. And that's my ambition too, so that great environments for walking, wheeling and cycling become a default expectation. And the choice to use active travel has to be safe and easy in our rural areas and smaller towns and villages, just as it should be in our cities. So there is still much more for us to do. That's why I published uh, the new cycling framework for active travel in April this year. It supports our 2030 active travel vision, where walking, wheeling and cycling are the most popular modes of transport for shorter everyday journeys. It'll shape how 
Government, councils and active travel organisations work together to deliver ambitious improvements and help remove barriers to cycling across the country. The ambition shown by this Government uh, in committing to the highest level of capital funding for active travel anywhere in the UK, and by far the highest amount in our history, means that we are starting to deliver. That is why I am very pleased today to announce uh, an additional £20 million of active travel infrastructure funding going direct to local authorities, regional transport partnerships and national park authorities. This is the new Active Travel Transformation Fund. It has been developed over the last few months in partnership with local authorities and other partners as a step toward reinvigorating our delivery models for next year and beyond. This morning I visited the south side of Glasgow and heard from City Council colleagues about how this fund has enabled the delivery of a project that will extend the already impressive South City Way connecting to the new Victoria Hospital and a nearby housing development of 400 homes. This is a £2.5 million scheme that will improve local public spaces, prioritise people over vehicles uh, and improve connectivity throughout the area. Uh, if it's brief, I need to make some progress. I should say also at this point, we do have time in hand. Liam Kerr. Uh, very briefly, Minister, those funds that have just been given, will they be ring-fenced to councils or will they be open for councils to use as they please? Minister. The, the Active Travel Transformation Fund is available for councils to bid uh, to, to put bring forward their projects uh, and uh, that money will be uh, spent on delivering those projects. The, the fund will deliver these projects right across Scotland. So, for example, the £1.6 million to deliver the Phase 2 of the Alva Academy link in Clackmanager. That is not only going to improve active travel for local children, it will also provide links to key employment centres that support around 1,000 workers. So it will help address transport poverty. Uh, if, if it, just give me a moment. The fund will also enable safe travel within rural communities. In Habost and the Isle of Lewis, we will provide £175,000 to connect the village with their local school. We have been clear in our desire to develop this fund through a partnership approach, both directly with delivery bodies and also through COSLA. So I want to say how grateful I am for the constructive work of our partners, uh, helping to ensure that the fund meets local needs wherever possible. Uh, I give way to Sarah Boyack. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for letting me make an intervention? Is this a one-off pot of money, or is this now going to be year-on-year -year funding built in so local authorities can use it going forward every single year? Minister. The, the development of this project is uh, designed to be in line with the transformation project, the, the wider transformation of the delivery of active travel. We know that we need to change those delivery models if we're going to have a, a way of delivering active travel that's on the scale and at the level of ambition that the, the budgets to come uh, uh, set out. So because of that, we, we've uh, launched this transformation fund in this year uh, to, 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 to trial that model of giving this money directly to local authorities. But because of the way that we've developed it in this first year, uh, we've removed match funding requirements from the fund uh, because we know that can make delivery difficult, particularly for smaller uh, delivery partners. We've got this great first group of projects in, in this year that have been funded. But beyond that, the process of doing this has identified a pipeline of projects worth nearly £700 million across, uh, across Scotland. So I want to commend the genuine ambition that's been demonstrated by everyone who's developed these. And that pipeline of projects uh, stand us in great stead. It means that we've got an exciting portfolio uh, of projects that are ready to go, matching the scale of our budget commitments. Because of the uh, the, the, the real work of this fund is about turning uh, ambition into delivery. I don't just want to see strategies. I want to see cycleways. I want to see these pipeline projects turned into the fantastic environments for walking, wheeling and cycling that Scotland needs. So the projects included in today's funding announcement around the country will help to do that, but it is just the beginning. The fund will deliver a diverse range of active travel infrastructure, uh, including in both urban and rural locations. And by providing more safe, segregated infrastructure, these projects will help to remove one of the key barriers to greater modal shift toward active travel. Presiding officer, uh, obviously I couldn't uh, lead a debate on uh, walking, wheeling and cycling today without reflecting on a huge event that's happening this summer and Scotland's unique position as the first ever country to host the UCI Cycling 
World Championships. Now, you'll be relieved, and I'm sure members will be as well, to know that I'm not the kind of person you'll ever see uh, in a Lytra skin suit hurtling around a velodrome. I'm much more likely to be found going sedately along Sockyall Street, dressed pretty much as I am today. But that difference, that difference captures a challenge and an opportunity from the championship. The presence of world-class athletes from 13 disciplines and something like a million spectators converging on the country for two weeks, it'll be a sporting spectacle. But I don't want it to leave a sense that active travel means only cycling or that cycling means only elite athletes using expensive specialist bikes. Our task is to create a legacy that's about active travel as a way of going to work to school, to the shops. It's also noticeable, I think, over the decades that many of the countries with cycling superstars are also those with much more significant levels of everyday active travel. We don't have to look far afield. Here in the UK, we've seen people like Chris Boardman, former Olympic uh, gold medalist and Tour de France yellow jersey holder, now working as the National Active Travel Commissioner with Active Travel England. And of course, here in Scotland, we've got our own incredibly successful former professional cyclist in Lee Craigie, our ambassador for active travel. Lee is due to complete her term in that role in September. And I want to express my gratitude for the contribution that she's made to our national conversation on active travel. Lee has been passionate, considered and thoughtful in her role. And most importantly, she has provided consistent, robust challenge to government as well. I'm sure she's looking forward to supporting Scottish cycling ahead of the UCI World Championships over the summer and continuing to show that, that cycling is for everyone. So, presiding officer, whether you are training for the World Championships, cycling to school or work every day, or just heading out for a little bit of exercise every once in a while, you deserve to be able to do that in confidence and in safety. It saddens me when I hear people tell me that they would love to cycle more, that they love their children to walk or scoot to school, but they fear for their safety. And yet again this week, we have seen tragic reports of deaths and injuries on our roads. Far too many people have lost friends and family members who were simply walking, wheeling and cycling to get around. One death, one serious injury on our roads is one too many. So I would say again, as a nation, we've still got a great deal more to do here. We can, must and will do better. We are putting in place the right building blocks. That record level of investment of nearly £190 million this year, the even higher commitment of £320 million next year, the new active travel transformation fund of £20 million that I've announced today, the commitment to make sure that we get results uh, not just from how we do active travel policy, but transport as a whole, as well as planning, economic development, procurement and more. And the recognition that we get the best results when we work together, national government, local government, regional transport partnerships, the third sector, and above all, the communities giving leadership and bringing forward their ideas for change. So as the Scottish Government, we'll continue to make that sustained investment working together to achieve an active travel transformation for Scotland. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Graeme Simpson to speak to and move Amendment 9328.2. Well, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I start uh, by saying how shocked I was uh, to hear about the resignation of Kevin Stewart um, as Transport Minister and his reasons for stepping down? Uh, and I can only wish him the very best uh, in his recovery, because I've always got on uh, with Kevin in whatever ministerial role he performs. Um, and and uh, I'd also say that uh, I agree with uh, pretty much everything uh, that Patrick Harvey uh, has just said, and that might surprise him. Um, I do hope that everyone uh, take it. I think Doug, is Douglas Ross still there? No, I thought he was about to sack me for saying that. Um, <laughs> I, I do hope that everyone uh, taking part in the debate today was able to do some active travelling uh, over what was a glorious weekend. Um, I certainly got on my bike, and I know that Mr Harvey might wish me to do that with a degree of permanence, uh, but it was good. Now... Can I say that um, Brian Whittle, my good friend Brian Whittle and I recently uh, cycled out from East Kilbride towards Straven on a cycle route 
which uses country roads. And we didn't get to Straven because we came across a farm which had diversified into to open uh, an outdoor cafe, and that was good. <laughs> and that was good. That was good enough for us. Uh, and the many locals that were using it. Um, now I've cycled that route many times, and I have to say that the roads, and it is all on road, are in an appalling state, and are dangerous to cyclists uh, in parts. And given that many cyclists have to go on the road, we need to concentrate on making them fit for purpose. Now, Mr. Whittle and myself enjoyed a few hours of old codger chat, and we will do so again soon, I hope. Uh, we are not, you'll be pleased to hear, presiding officer, uh, middle-aged men in Lycra, uh, just like the minister. My own approach is that you don't have to wear special clothing to jump on a bike. I have, though, taken to wearing a helmet most of the time. That came about for me during lockdown, when I was cycling a lot more than I had been, and I felt uh, a couple of things. Um, one, as I said earlier, the roads were dreadful, and I considered there was a real risk that I could be thrown off my bike. The roads are worse now, so the risk is greater. And secondly, that if I got a bright helmet, it would help me to be seen by motorists, many of whom, let's face it, have little regard for cyclists. The too many people don't feel safe on a bike. And that has to change. We need to make the infrastructure better, and we need to take people with us on that mission. So segregated routes are very important. The minister mentioned uh, Barcelona earlier. Uh, and I've cycled in Barcelona, uh, and he's right to say that they, um, they didn't start off from a good point, but they have put in segregated routes, and it's perhaps a good example of how things can be done. Now, here in Edinburgh, there are some fast, fantastic off-road routes. The city is spoiled in many ways. It's investing heavily in more routes too, but the council has too often been heavy-handed in its approach and lacking in common sense. Now, I don't want to get too parochial about this, but I recently cycled across the foot of Leith Walk where the tramway has been built, and I just thought, what the heck is going on? And I'm not alone. It has conflict written all over it. And I can see the ministers uh, agreeing with me there. Now, all of us in this chamber back greater investment in active travel, be it cycling, walking, or wheeling. We went into the last Scottish Parliament elections calling for 10% of the transport budget to be spent on active travel, and thankfully that is now the government's position. But right now, a number of third sector organisations are worried about their funding, uh, and there's a fear of redundancy. Now, Sustrans were recently quoted as saying, with less Scottish Government funding, we are left with no choice but to make cuts, which will reduce our impact on changing the way people travel every day. As a result, 21 of our Sustrans colleagues in Scotland are now at risk of redundancy, and there will be an end or reduction to programmes right across Scotland. Some organisations have worked for months without funding. That's not good enough if we're to maintain any sort of momentum. Uh, certainly. Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. The, the member, like uh, those across the chamber, will be aware of the, the additional pressures that come from the current financial uh, situation, including uh, inflation and its impact on the Scottish budget, the, the need to ensure uh, scrutiny in there. But actually, one of the reasons for increased scrutiny in active travel is the increased level of budget. Uh, as something comes up the, the scale in terms of uh, uh, scale of spend, it does require additional scrutiny across the Scottish gov Government's budget. I'm very, very grateful for the active travel partners uh, understanding of the, the additional pressures that that brings to bear and the extra work that they've done to provide the information that allows us uh, to clear a huge amount of the spending that we've already committed to. And they know uh, that this government is fully committed to a hugely increased budget, uh, unlike those elsewhere in the UK. Graham Simpson. Well, I want to talk about Scotland, and the fact is that there are organisations out there who do not have a level of certainty over their funding. And, and when people like Sustrans are having to potentially make people redundant, that sends out a very negative message. Now, in March last year, we debated active travel, and I wish Mr. Harvey all the best at that time in his new role, and I offered to work together on this policy area in which we agree on so much. That hasn't happened, but I make the offer again. I'd be happy to have regular meetings with Mr. Harvey 
So I look forward to his office getting in touch to set that up. Now, one issue I've mentioned before, in fact, during that previous debate, is the lack of resources within councils, and that's hampering progress. That's something I mentioned uh, in my amendment, which I now move, presiding officer. Now, some councils don't have the expertise anymore. They may not have the people to run road safety courses. It could be anything. There's a great project which has been talked about when I was a councillor in South Lanarkshire and which has been stalled apparently because of resources. The Westburn Viaduct crosses the Clyde. Trains stopped using it in the 1980s and it's been closed ever since. But there's a plan in place to open it up and create a walking and cycling route over the river, which would be fantastic. And I think my understanding is that Sustrans are geared up to go ahead, but there's no agreement on which council, Glasgow or South Lanarkshire, either side of the river, would maintain the new path. And this challenge of adoption of infrastructure for maintenance is a significant barrier to delivery. So maybe the minister can assist in breaking that deadlock in the West, Westburn case, but it could, it could genuinely be a transformational project. I have to say, I do think there should be a dedicated fund. Yes, yes. Fiona Hislop. where the old railway line was converted into a very accessible, well-used cycle track. And obviously, West Lothian Council and the Lanarkshire Council, they are obviously managed to work together collectively. So perhaps that could be an example to, 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 to cite locally. Graeme Simpson. Uh, that's a very good example. I'm uh, very familiar with the route, having cycled it. Uh, and uh, uh, look forward to uh, cycling with uh, Miss Hislop, actually. Um, at one of her uh, the lo lo local projects which she's invited me to. Um, hopefully we can do that over the summer. That, should be, that would be fantastic. <laughs> now, so, so I've referred um, many times to the government's well-meaning target of reducing car miles by a fifth by 2030. That's a mere seven years away. And so far, the government has said nothing about how this will be achieved. But we do know that the pace uh, of delivery of those impressive active travel targets needs to be stepped up. The cross-party group on sustainable transport, which I convene, produced a report on this in November, uh, and we had five recommendations, uh, which I'll just run through. First was provide clarity around policies, expected impacts, and timescales for implementation. Second, pursue policies that target unnecessary car journeys. Third, consider the equalities uh, impacts of traffic reduction policies. Fourth, ensure greater affordability of public transport services. And finally, include van traffic as part of the traffic reduction target. We should consider the impact of freight on traffic volumes and emissions from road traffic. It must be ensured that re reduction in emissions from cars is not cancelled out by an increase of emissions from delivery vans. So far, I've not seen any progress in meeting these recommendations. Nothing the Minister has said today has convinced me that we have any hope of persuading more people to use public transport. And if anything, the little progress has been in active travel is going backwards. Presiding officer, uh, you know active travel is good for the nation. Walking for 30 minutes or cycling for 20 minutes on most days reduces mortality risk by at least 10%. Active commuting is associated with an approximate 10% decrease in risk for cardiovascular disease and a 30% decrease in type 2 diabetes risk. And cancer-related mortality is 30% lower among bike commuters. It's also a fact that a large number of people don't have cars, so we should be making life easier for them and encouraging those that do to use them less often. Now, my amendment does not seek to wipe out the Minister's motion. It keeps most of it and merely says the Government should set out some of its plans. That's not too much to ask if we all want to improve active travel. So I urge the Chamber to back the amendment and um, hopefully we can all move in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Mercedes Vialba to speak to and move Amendment 9382.1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me begin by 
associate, associating Labour with um, the comments from members following the resignation of Kevin Stewart. We wish him well in his recovery. In opening today's debate for Labour, let me start by somewhat belatedly welcoming the Minister to his role, because in his own words, it's no secret that he enjoys cycling, and his personal engagement on the subject of active travel stretches back to well before he took on this portfolio. So I hope that from his appointment, we'll see enthusiastic prioritisation of active travel infrastructure in Scotland and that we'll see progress through cross-party work on this shared goal. Because we in Labour believe that active travel can bring significant benefits for our health, our economy and our environment. But none of these benefits will be achieved without significant investment, planning and promotion. So, while we welcome the Scottish Government's funding commitments and progress on the new cycling framework, we must also be honest about where the Government is letting us down. Council budgets have been slashed. Road repairs are waiting. Planning delayed. Pavement parking widespread. Speeding rampant. Congestion is building and air pollution is choking us. So why does active travel matter? Active travel isn't just about leisure, it's about making it easier to get from A to B off our own steam. Not just because it will improve our health, but because it will improve our environment and save us money. If we can find a way to make this one switch, the benefits will be transformational. So its importance cannot be overstated. I'd like to make some progress. We know from research that active travel is associated with lower likelihoods of having diabetes and hypertension. And research demonstrates positive mental health benefits from active travel. One study based in London found that walking to work is significantly associated with higher life satisfaction compared to commuting by car. In fact, commuters who maintained cycling to work for a one-year period reported lower sickness absences and improved mental health than commuters who travelled by non-active means. And it's not only our health that improves through active travel. It's the health of our environment. Changes in active travel have significant life cycle carbon emissions benefits. Research found that an average person exchanging one car journey per day for cycling for four days per week would decrease mobility related life cycle CO2 emissions by about half a ton per year. That's roughly as much CO2 as would be captured by 25 trees in a year. So imagine if we all made that switch. We would be quite literally a forest of millions. And with fewer cars on the roads, we'll rid our environment of the relentless drone of traffic and quicken our nature recovery. We saw this during the pandemic. At first, we noticed the quiet. But then we heard the birds and other wildlife as they reclaimed the outdoors. But as much as we know we ought to take better care of our health and our environment, it's hard to begin to think about this when the immediate reality is financial hardship of low pay, of high prices, of increasing demands on our time. It's not just that public transport is too expensive, it's that it's too often impractical. When you're on a zero hours contract, who has time to plan a journey with multiple changes? When you're working in healthcare or hospitality, who can be sure that they will finish work before the last bus to get home? And when you're in insecure housing, forced to move every six months, who has the time to book three months in advance to find the cheapest deals? And when you're juggling childcare and caring responsibilities, whose plans won't change at short notice? So it's no wonder that so many of us still opt for the reliability and convenience of a private vehicle. 
And once we're reliant on private vehicles, where would a walk or cycle fit in other than on a rare day off? And let's remember access to and experience of active travel is impacted by our gender, our ethnicity, and whether we have a, dis a disability. We know that a lack of lighting in public parks and some streets means that women are less likely to walk or cycle after dark. We know that uneven paths and pavement parking can make it harder for people with disabilities to get around. And we know that people who are from uh, black, Asian or minority ethnic backgrounds are disproportionately impacted by air pollution as they are more likely to live in areas of environmental deprivation. So our encouragement of active travel must be inclusive while seeking to redress social as well as economic inequalities. Because the truth is, the current choice between a private vehicle or active travel combined with public transport is not a fair one. What we're experiencing is a problem with our whole transport network, with the planning system and with our political culture. That is that when government retreats, private commerce fills the void. And so rather than build what many need, they build what a few can profit from. And who does profit from us being in this impossible situation? The oil companies, the multinationals, the private developers, the list goes on. And who pays? Our pockets, our family's health, our neighbours' businesses and our polluted environment. So the Scottish Government's commitment to increasing active travel spending to 10% of the overall transport budget is welcome. Labour made the same call in our own manifesto, but we cannot stop there. We have to account for the reality that economic and social inequality has created uh, sorry, is created by implementing a gendered and diversity approach to transport infrastructure that ensures safety, convenience and affordability are properly addressed, particularly for protected characteristics, including women, BAME people and those with disabilities. And we must end the cuts to local authorities and invest in insourcing to treat active travel like the vital public service that it is with well-paid, unionised public sector workers at the heart of it. A recent study also showed that mothers participating in active travel led to more active children and young people, which contributes to long-term habits that are good not just for themselves but for our planet. These are benefits that will build up over time reducing strain on our health, our health service and our roads if we take that opportunity to invest now. That's why it's disappointing that in February we heard that only 3,650 bikes had been given out to school children so far. That's significantly below the 145,000 families that should be eligible for them. So alongside infrastructure investment, we must also ensure that this has the greatest impact by following up with support and promotion to encourage behaviour change. Active travel policy must be more than just encouraging people to walk, wheel and cycle at the weekends. It must fit within an integrated, publicly owned transport system so that it becomes the best choice for commuters. It must be rolled out alongside reductions in speed limits around our education centres so that every child and young person has a safe and healthy journey to school, to college and to university. And it must enhance our natural environment so that every journey comes with the benefit of wildlife and natural beauty. Greater participation in active travel is the culture change that we need, not just to protect what we have, and to combat climate change, but to make all of our lives a little more joyful as we travel and work alongside each other. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Vialba. I now call on Beatrice Wishart for around six minutes. Ms. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
And can I echo what other members have said today about the sudden resignation of the Transport Minister and I send him my good wishes for a speedy recovery. The UCI Cycling World Championships coming to Scotland in August 2023 will be a chance to showcase Scotland and the UK once again to the world. This will bring a great tourism boost to Glasgow and surrounding areas and the, which the sector will no doubt welcome after the COVID-19 disruption. I'm sure it will also inspire people to dust down their bikes and get back on the saddle, although I can't guarantee I may be one of them. For young Scots, I hope it will spark enjoyment and intrigue, developing an enduring pastime. Whether a quick trip to the shops, to work, or a leisurely cycle in nature, we know the health benefits such a trip can make. Presiding officer, for many of us using our car is the simple default and easy means to travel. Roads take us where we want to go. We're sheltered from the weather. We don't have to think about exerting ourselves to overcome a hill, and we're on our own timetable. That simplicity is the challenge walking, wheeling and cycling must compete with. Addressing the things a car driver doesn't have to think twice about will go some way to getting more people walking, wheeling and cycling. Progress on ambitions are at an early stage and I note it will be in the next financial year that the Scottish Government fulfils the Butte House Agreement for 10% of the transport budget to be spent on active travel three years into this session of Parliament. But it's not simply money that will help reach these ambitions. Societal and behaviour changes are needed. I think we can all recognise the benefits of active travel, from saving money to health improvement to helping the planet. But we are not all switching our cars for bikes on short journeys. Transport Scotland figures show a previous high of 1.8% of journeys under five miles being taken by bike, last achieved in 2018, only modestly climbing to 2.8% in 2021. That said, I note the change in methodology for the pandemic-affected years. Safety looms large as a concern. Research from Cycling Scotland shows that two-thirds two would be more likely to consider cycling if there was less traffic on the roads. While changes in cycle lane configuration will address some of these concerns, there are more structural matters behind the scenes. Cycling Scotland's research also highlighted the stubborn gender gap, with almost 80% of women saying that they would be more likely to cycle if there was less traffic on the road, compared to just over 60% of men saying the same. Men also state that they, are, they were more confident cycling compared to responses from women. This speaks for the need for gender-sensitive gender planning more widely. And those from minority communities are also underrepresented on the saddle. And I note the work of Sustrans Community Active Travel Support Service to address this. Our active travel infrastructure needs to be accessible across the board for everyone to feel they can use and enjoy. Even during COVID-19 restrictions and policies such as spaces for people, cycling didn't seem to become that much more attractive to people. We will have to see how these figures stack up in the future with COVID-19 restri restrictions fully lifted. To reflect further on Transport Scotland figures, 2020 and 2021 show an increase in walking, with almost 60% of journeys under two miles by walking in 2020, and that sat at almost 48% in 2019. Again, figures will need to be assessed within the context of the full lifting of the pandemic restrictions, as there was a slight fall to 56% in 2021. But work building new paths, connecting old paths, and re-evaluating urban spaces can boost active travel. I note the ambition for 20-minute neighbourhoods to encourage uptaking and walking, wheeling and cycling. A lot of this, though, does not apply to rural and island Scotland, where a car is a luxury. It's a necessity. For island and rural areas, there will be always be need to be alternative there will always need to be alternatives to active travel to cross the greater distances and geographical challenges and for some accessibility needs are only met by car but that doesn't mean we can't make improvements and we must do what we can to make car travel sustainable with advances in electric vehicles and charging points as well as investing in our public transport so to conclude 
the Scottish Government is moving in the right direction with investment and strategy development, and we'll continue to scrutinise this work, which is still in its infancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Wisher. We now move to the open debate. Um, I can uh, confirm that we still have quite a bit of time in hand, so anybody taking an intervention will get the time back and possibly a bonus uh, over and above that. I call firstly Christine Graham to be followed by Brian Whittle for a generous six minutes. Ms. Deputy Graham. Presiding Officer, I must know what the bonus is first. I mean, I have to have notice of what the bonus will be. Anyway, pleased to support the Government motion. I welcome the additional £20 million funding, and we begin by saying, as others have said, that one of the unexpected and rare bonuses of COVID and its restrictions were the empty roads and streets, which made walking, but in particular cycling, safer and indeed more joy enjoyable. Indeed, as a consequence in the capital, Edinburgh city streets have many designated cycle lanes, which must give a degree of comfort to cyclists and indeed to motorists. Though I would say in passing, that some cyclists riding through Holyrood Park do not use these, but insist on using the road. I don't know why. Some also do not wear reflective clothing and may have a bright front light, but simply rely on the rear reflector light on their bike to alert motorists. And that is all we can see. I cannot fathom that either. But back to roads. Cycle lanes are, of course, not available, nor would they be practical in the main arterial roads in my constituency, the A7, the A7, A68, A7, A701, 702 and 703. They are tricky to drive, let alone cycle. And of course, there is the hazard of the Sheriff Hall roundabout, known to the cyclists as the meat grinder, where the A7 meets the city bypass. I have never seen a cyclist trying to tackle the Sheriff Hall roundabout. <laughs> But local and short distances are being tackled, and I'll start with the border schools, getting children into the habit and to have confidence in cycling. There we have the example of living streets. We had a visit to Stow Primary in February with its WOW, or Walk to School Challenge. This is a pupil-led initiative where children self-report how they get to school every day using the interactive WOW Travel Tracker. Pupils who travel actively at least once a week for a month are rewarded with a WOW badge. WOW schools see an average of 5 to 10 per cent increase in pupils walking to school in Scotland, with a corresponding drop in car use, helping to reduce congestion and indeed increase safety outside the school gates. Indeed, Scottish Borders Council rewarded 1.2 million spaces for people funding from the Scottish Government, which included spend on measures such as 20 mile an hour speed limits in every town and village to make the road safer for walkers and cyclists. The Clovenfords to Cadenfoot Road was closed as part of that and proved such a success that the closure was made permanent to create a car free stretch, which is now used extensively by dog walkers and cyclists. The local primary school are also making use of the grass football pitch halfway down the road because there is now safe access, as previously it was a 60 mile an hour road with no pavement. That 20 mile an hour limit is now fully operational across the borders. This has, I believe, improved the lives of communities such as in Stow, which is a very narrow pavement abutting the busy and also very narrow A7 and busy A7, which runs right through the village. In Gala Shields, there's a new hike and bike hub, which was opened last year in Channel Street, aiming to promote active travel and healthy leisure activities and make them available to everyone, regardless of income, on a, quote, pay-as-you-can, close quotes, basis. So some are hired, some are reduced rate, and some are free. There are also many bike recycling social enterprises. Examples, one such as Pennycook Recycles, another at Stow Cycle Hub, right at the station, which also includes hire, and yet another in Tweed Bank called Just Cycle, which recycles bikes designed for the tip. So you don't need to have a lot of money to have a bike. Some of these are terrific bargains. There's a 51-mile circular cycle route through the Scottish borders that goes through Tweed Bank Melrose, past Leader Viaduct, into Scotsview, and there's others running parallel with the Tweed, east and west, absolutely protected and away from the main road, very flat and quite often tarmac, so also suitable for wheelchairs and prams. Borders Buses carries the sign, quotes, the bus you can take your bike on. 
close quotes, it has 23 bike-friendly buses, so that takes you away from these very busy roads which you can't cycle on, get your bike on the bus in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and take it or take it on the train. And of course, there's the famous mountain biking centre at Glentress, which is for real cyclists with different levels of biking trails. I've never been in any of them and never intend to be. I value my bones. In Midlothian, the council has been funded over 266,000 for three projects. And one of these, I'll give an example, is called Shawfair Connections. It's to be completed in 2026. This is important because Shawfair is an area which has a huge housing development adjacent to Borders Railway Station. It's commencing in October this year and will consider priority routes for active travel infrastructure in the Shawfair area. Now, this is what's important. We'll look at planning ahead when you're doing developments, building active travel routes at the beginning. And, of course, there's many cycle paths across Midlothian. Each Midlothian school has a travel plan, which aims to encourage pupils and staff to walk, cycle or scoot more often. Midlothian currently has 17 such primary schools, and in my patch it's Strathess, Cornbank and Cookin and Sacred Heart, and there's another, these are all in Pennycook, and another in Gore Bridge. There are also secondary school cycle clubs. Beeslack and Lasswood High School offer extracurricular cycle clubs, and Pennycook High is just in the process of starting it. So there's a lot of work, important work being done in primary and secondary schools. Other initiatives include inst installation of cycle lanes, where appropriate, not on some of the main roads, certainly, cycle and scooter parking provision at schools, route maps showing recommended safe routes to school, and something called participation in bike week, with an event include bling your bike, where pupils decorate their bike or scooter, and ticket to ride, where pupils receive raffle tickets for cycling, going into an end of week prize draw for cycle prizes. Rosalind Chapel and the National Mining Museum from Scotland have become the first two visitor attractions in the Lothians to achieve the Cyclist Welcome Award from Visit Scotland. So, substantial developments to encourage, in particular, more cycling. But safety for cyclists must be secure. I tried several years ago cycling to Parliament to access the cycle path through the park. I only had to cycle a short distance without the designated cycle path. I was knocked off by a passing car, lost my confidence, and confess my bike is now a very handy handbag rack in the hall, and there it will stay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. The bonus I referred to earlier, of course, is an annual membership to Glen Tress. Um, so we'll now oh. have Brian Whittle to be followed by uh, Fiona Hislop. Again, a generous six minutes, Mr. Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I have to say I, I rise here still reeling from the, the, the knowledge that I have been dropped as a, as a buddy of uh, Graham Simpson cycling in favour of Fiona Hislop. Um, but I am uh, delighted to be able to speak in this debate. And I think as members uh, are aware, uh, I'm a supporter of investment in active travel, encouraging that physical activity given our country's uh, poor health record. A recent report from December 22, 2022 in the Journal of Transport and Health says, and I quote, physical activity levels can be increased by implementing policies that provide convenient, safe and connected walking and cycling infrastructure, promoting active travel and give strong support to public transport. Uh, also, uh, there was, there was a, I read an article in the Science Direct which said, and again quoting, uh, providing new walking and or bike, bike infrastructure was strongly associated with increased levels of physical activity. And I think crucially it's making it easier to access uh, active travel encourages people to use active travel networks. But Sustrans uh, identified uh, a lack of funding as one of the main barriers that local authorities face in delivering that net zero even when government funding, uh, even when with, with government funding, local authorities struggle to secure the match funding required to be shortlisted for projects, which slows down the delivery of that infrastructure. And additionally, uh, they say that the cost of infrastructure maintenance is often too significant for local authorities to meet alone. And that brings me to the Conservative amendment in the name of, of Graham Simpson, which asks for a clear route and delivery plan that addresses how it will help local authorities that do not have capacity to achieve these targets. 
I wanted to have a look here at the introduction of the low emission zones, now that one is live in Glasgow. Um, and I looked at, um, again, a Sustrand 2019 report on reducing car use in Scottish cities. And they say that three ways to reduce car dependency are developing high quality neighbourhoods, improving public transport and provision walking and cycling across cities and make them competitive with driving and taking steps to reduce the number of cars within cities and towns. The problem I have here is I think the Scottish Government started at the third of those without recognising that people still have to travel across and into the city. The introduction of the car ban without developing uh, alternatives has put an increasing pressure on business, especially for those who drive older cars, disproportionately impacting those who can least afford car upgrades, of course. John Mason. I, th I, th I thank the member... I thank the member for giving way, but I mean, would you accept that actually Glasgow has a pretty good local transport system? My constituency has 11 railway stations and at least six bus routes, which are very frequent. So it's, it's not a rural area. We have very good public transport in Glasgow. Brian Whittle. I can thank John Mason uh, for that introduction, but if you have to get in and out of the city, it's problematic. And also, I think from a business perspective, looking at businesses, business people who have to travel from uh, one meeting to another, it is actually quite difficult to do so. Um, uh, I wanted to say that uh, what should have happened in that case is the infrastructure investment prior to the introduction of the low emission zone um, should have made the transformation as easy as possible for locals and commuters and businesses. The, uh, I, and that takes me to that some of the amendments that I did try to introduce when this bill went through Parliament in the last term, and specifically one I wanted to mention was that the uh, LEZ legislation should allow that all revenue incurred above administration of the scheme should be used for activities that contribute towards climate change targets and actions to reduce air pollution. Now, that, was, that was not passed, and it was also voted down by the Greens, which I think came as a bit of a surprise to me, because the LEZ bill does... Of course, yeah. Minister. Uh, I seem to remember just a few minutes ago, one of the member's colleagues was asking me uh, whether we shouldn't tell local authorities how they should use money that's provided for them. Now, is he saying that we should dictate from the centre how, how money should be used locally? Surely he can recognise that there's a case for decentralising that decision-making. Brian Whittle, I'll give you time back. The problem you have, of course, is that uh, and when you introduce this bill, as I said before, one of the things we, that should happen is there should be infrastructure prior to, uh, prior to the bill that should uh, make it easier for people to get around. But you already do centralise so much of, so much of the money, <laughs> Minister. In this particular instance, we should be making it easier for local councils to, uh, to, to uh, implement that infrastructure, because the LEZ bill does not ring fence a budget to support alternative ways to travel through the zones and there is no preparation of alternative travel infrastructure uh, that is joined up in a proactive manner. So we do need the Scottish Government to plan for the implementation of low emission zones and ensure travel is accessible and makes the decision to adopt public transport as easy as possible. I also want to mention a third sector organisation, Cycle Station, who recycle bikes in my area. And last year they recycled some 640 bikes, put them back into the community at a fraction of the cost of a new bike. Um, they are actively engaging with the community to improve their services. They've increased uh, cycle classes for cycle training and learn to ride sessions. They are now running four sessions a week on a Saturday morning for children aged 3 to 15. And they started out with kids as young as three on balance bikes. And on feedback from the community, they now offer tailor classes for children aged 7 to 10, which are now fully booked. Their bike re re uh, refurbishment uh, is aligned with the circular economy, and the good weather has boosted sales, and they are busy in their workshops with services repairs and the refurbishment of bike for reuse and redistribu redistribution. They now need additional space from, the, uh, from this expansion to meet demand in refurbishing parts as well as whole bikes. And as a, a Sustrand report states, um, many of their barriers uh, are, uh, uh, that they face uh, align with that Sustrand report, Sustrand's report, and they say that the biggest challenge last year was gaining 
funding for refurbishment of the new building in Darville to allow that expansion of our operation and facilities for the benefit of the community. So, um, the presiding officer, can I just say, I, I, I have invited the minister before to come and visit Cycle Station. I would again like to invite the minister to visit Cycle Station and see the, for himself the great work that they do. Presiding officer, perhaps that this is where we should be. The Scottish Government should look at how they could turbocharge their ambition by backing third sector organisations like Cycle Station who promote that active travel. It is economically prudent and they reach the very people we would all like to reach. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I now call Fiona Hislop to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Again, a generous six minutes, Ms Hislop. Presiding Officer, we all know the physical and mental health benefits of active travel by now, feeling clearer headed after some fresh air, being more productive after a walk, saving on fuel and reducing traffic in our streets. I have a daily 50 minutes walking as part of my commute to Holyrood via the train service and definitely feel the benefit. The Scottish Government has continually displayed its commitment to active travel and increasing levels of walking, cycling and wheeling. It has committed to spend at least £320 million, or 10% of the total transport budget, on active travel by 2024-25, up from £39 million in 2017-18. This funding will see projects throughout Scotland making public spaces more suitable for active travel, as well as pilot projects to improve accessibility to active travel. This could be offering free bikes to children who cannot afford them, bike storage schemes, shared hire schemes or bike riding and maintenance training for communities. And this comprehensive approach will benefit people's health and well-being, improve their connections and their communities, and not to mention the huge benefit to the environment in the form of reduced carbon emissions and traffic congestion. West Lothian, which I represent as a county with small towns with regular commuters, we are well placed to demonstrate how active travel can work encouraging residents to make use of biking or walking to train or bus stations rather than driving into cities. I would urge the Minister to prioritise such hub and spoke links in West Lothian in funding and not just prioritise cities. Walking or wheeling to public transport hubs on the M8 and the M9 for bus and to rail stations, including the new station we need at Winchborough, just makes sense to stop car commuting. In Linlithgow, our... Yes, indeed. Liam Kerr. Uh, very grateful. The Net Zero Committee that we both sit on produced uh, a comprehensive report some uh, six months or so ago saying that one of the main concerns for councils is a lack of skills to deliver net zero programmes and particularly around active travel. Is the member aware of whether the Scottish Government's taken that particular recommendation to increase skills on board? If you want to hit up, I can give the time. Back. Well, I think the issues, particularly around planning, we know uh, affect whether it's infrastructure for active travel or indeed other areas around net zero. And my concern, particularly around this issue, is regional transport partnerships and are they really effective at joining up and sharing the skills between local authorities, as indeed might have been referred to by Mr Simpson. In Linlithgow, uh, we have seen a world-class cycling facility. It's just been opened at the end of May by Minister Marie Todd. The West Lothian Cycle Circuit has been built, yes, for competitions, but also to provide access to a safe, traffic-free environment uh, for cycling for children to learn, or adults, particularly women, to learn again to cycle safely and confidently. And I did suggest to Mr Simpson, as he is a keen cyclist, that he may wish to visit the West Lothian uh, cycle circuit. This year, from the 3rd uh, to the 30th of August, the UCI World Championships, the world's, we'll see the world's greatest cyclists come together uh, across Scotland to compete at the highest level. They'll make history and show the world the power of the bike. It is the biggest global cycling event ever staged, featuring 13 world championships across seven disciplines and this world-class event will inspire and motivate people to try a bike again uh, at this cycle circuit we have in West Lothian. I am proud to have played my part in negotiating and securing the UCI World Championship event for Scotland when I was a minister. Constituents also benefit from the West Lothian Bike Library, who work in partnership with the Council to help people to get active and connected through cycling. And I would encourage my constituents to take part in the West Lothian Council consultation on active travel to inform the West Lothian Active Travel Plan and also then uh, help them to bid for the funds that the Minister referred to. 
I have also had the opportunity to work directly with Sustrans, uh, West Lothian Council and my constituents to actively improve active transport links in my own constituency. Capstan Walk is a stretch of pathway linking the outlying Springfield area of Linlithgow to the town centre, and it was in a state of disrepair, despite being a pathway, a core pathway, used by pupils going to schools and by local people to commute to the train station. So working collaboratively with Sustrans, West Lothian Council, I worked with constituents and coordinated the um, efforts to get the, the pathway repaired, and now much is it's now much more suitable for wheeling use. So this work is an example of allowing accessible to all pathways, encouraging walkers, cyclists, wheelchair users and prams uh, to travel into their own town centre safely and actively rather than driving. The National Cycle Network through uh, Scotland consists of roughly uh, 1,643 miles of routes in Scotland, including 702 miles of traffic-free routes using railway pass, canal tow pass, forest roads, shared pass, shared use paths, segregated cycle lanes and redetermined rural footways. And the National Cycle Network is a massive asset to Scotland. It cuts through my constituency, enabling people to actively explore this beautiful country. Looking at figures for 1920, we can see the benefit of the National Cycle Network. It was used by 4.2 million people, 70.9 million car trips were saved, 1.64 billion was spent in local businesses by leisure and tourist users, and 21.5 million was saved by the NHS through the network's impact on people's health. We also know that the current planning system creates a, a dependency on cars, and I would ask the Minister, are planning stipulations for 2.4 cars in new housing developments still happening? And we know that the Section 75 agreements could be better utilised by local authorities to support sustainable and accessible active travel and public transport links. And recently, constituents in Bridgend and my constituency contacted me wanting to see the Council make use of Section 75 agreements from proposed housing developments to promote cycle paths. Active travel is not a priority for the Conservative Party, with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak recently receiving an open letter from a coalition of charities, professional organisations and businesses using, urging a reversal of the proposed cuts to active uh, funding announced by UK Transport Secretary Mark Harper on the 9th of March. In comparison, the Scottish Government is putting the health and wellbeing of citizens and the environment at the heart of policy, with record levels of funding for active travel in Scotland. President Officer, the Scottish Government has consistently demonstrated its commitment to active transport. This positive development must continue, and we will continue to see changes in people's health, the environment and the economy. There is a lot of power in active travel, allowing people to change lifestyles for the better, to help our environment, and very importantly, in the 21st century, connecting people in a greener, more sustainable way, and I am pleased to support the Minister's motion. Thank you, Ms Hislop. I now call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Claire Baker again in generous six minutes. Ms Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A quarter of Scotland's emissions come from transport, and cars account for the largest share of this at 38%. Cutting transport emissions is vital if we are to prevent irreversible climate change and lead healthier lives. The Scottish Government's aim to reduce car kilometres by 20% by 2030 is an important goal, and good active travel options do a great deal to reduce car use. As the Minister and others have mentioned, the UCI Cycling World Championships taking place across Scotland, including in my Stirling constituency this August, will be a fantastic showcase for cycling and active travel. However, we must also take this opportunity to understand why people are not choosing active travel, including a lack of infrastructure. Smaller rural communities often suffer from connectivity issues, both within communities and between neighbouring areas. Fast roads with no pavements and poor public transport links make getting around sustainably a challenge. Paired with increasing centralisation of services, including GPs and supermarkets, this leads to higher resilience on cars. Indeed, Stirling has the highest vehicle ownership per thousand population in Scotland at 584. Reliance on cars also entrenches inequalities and limits accessibility, accessibility for those without access to a car. 
In my constituency, there are key gaps in active travel infrastructure, and these still need to be filled, such as the much-needed connection between Dune and Calendar. There is a massive demand for this. Constituents ask about it all the time. But at present, there is no safe or accessible route. Um, and yesterday, I wrote to Sustrans for an update on progress. Across my constituency, proactive rural communities are delivering excellent active travel projects. The Calern Community Futures Company are working on a path to better connect new developments with the rest of the village. Regrettably, the planning system had allowed the developer to provide only a narrow pavement link for walking, with no provision for cycling or wheeling. The community decided to take action and applied for Sustrans Places for Everyone funding. Although NPF4 is a great step towards prioritising active travel links and planning, those involved with this project ask for higher minimum standards for new developments. When I spoke to Stirling Council about active travel in rural areas, they highlighted that there are indeed many engaged rural communities who are keen for improvement. However, when projects are prioritised on a value-for-money basis, those in areas with lower-density populations are harder to find a business case for. Although these rural routes would not have the same number of core users as city routes, they are, they are still an important step in connecting our rural communities and reducing car use. They highlighted the potential for a dedicated fund for rural projects in order to progress key links. But this was also, they also needed um, provision of funds for maintenance, because that is also an important issue. The Scottish Government has committed to spend, as we have heard, at least £320 million, 10 per cent of the total transport budget on active travel by 2025. And I welcome the new £20 million transformation fund. Through funding going directly to delivery partners, this will support faster progress on infrastructure improvements. And I hope that specific funds will be dedicated to rural areas. I'm also pleased that the Scottish Government's long-term vision for active travel in Scotland 2030 highlights the importance of better maintenance and increased provision in rural areas. It's much needed and I'm very eager to hear how these plans will be achieved. As we transition to more active travel, it is likely that we will remain car dependent for the near future. In the absence of reliable public transport links, steps should also be taken to find short-term solutions for rural communities. In my constituency, the community in Dune have faced very high levels of car traffic and a lack of parking. They have worked hard to come up with an innovative solution in the form of Park and Stride. An old council site outside the village has been repurposed for parking and electric vehicle charging. This encourages those who can to walk through the village to Dune Castle, made famous by Outlander and M Monty Python. The aim of the project is to reduce congestion in the village and increase footfall to local businesses and encourage visitors to spend more time in the village. Presiding officer, we look to other nations admiring their active travel infrastructure, and it's easy to forget though that the bike culture of somewhere like the Netherlands is not a natural phenomenon. As the Minister has noted, it's the product of hard work, fierce activism and investment over the course of many years. And it will take hard work here too, but the outcome will be so worthwhile. Reduce car use, lower emissions, cleaner air, increased well-being. The benefits are many. And I look forward to seeing how the Scottish Government will ensure our rural communities see progress too. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Tweed. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by Joan Swinney. And in six minutes, please, Ms. Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I first apologise for my need to leave the chamber soon, as I have a meeting with the Minister for Parliamentary Business and my role as a committee convener. But I'll endeavour to be back as soon as possible, and I hope to be here for closing speeches. And thank you to the President Officer for accepting my request. Uh, we know how important active travel is to reducing emissions and to improving health, alongside the other related benefits. But travelling around Scotland, it is clear to see there is much more we need to do to shift away from car use. Our local authorities have a key role in delivery, but they face huge challenges in terms of funding and also in securing the skills needed to deliver on programmes like Active Travel, which are vital to net zero. Their budgets have been under significant pressure for a number of years and increasing the Active Travel budget now won't compensate for over a decade of cuts. We need to see consistent investment which prioritises encouraging and enabling people to get out of their cars to walk and to cycle so that we can reap the benefits for health, for the environment and for all our communities. To encourage active travel at the levels we want to see it needs to be a key core part of infrastructure development, thought about in conjunction with public transport, housing and planning and social inclusion, both at an initial stage and in terms of maintenance. We need to think about the range of ways active travel can be built into our lives and communities and ensure that people are able to access local services as well as onward transport routes. When we look at provision in terms of cycling, we have seen you know, some significant improvement within cities and towns, but these have been a bit too piecemeal. There are too often cycle routes which come to an abrupt stop and there are too few fully formalised routes with segregated lanes. Segregated lanes. There have been nowhere near enough improvements in connecting towns and villages with cycling networks so that people could cycle into towns and cities from the countryside and vice versa. Making these connections can stimulate local economies and open up Scotland to more people, including those on lower incomes. We have seen how the North Coast 500 has been used to bring in tourists to that part of the country, but we should be looking at promoting cycling equivalents, which would bring people to enjoy our scenery, our communities and our hospitality by getting around on their bikes. In fact, there are some beautiful uh, coastal routes, and I welcome the recent improvements we've seen round about Aberdour, but there are still gaps. And as for walking routes, we need to look at the condition of the path network and consider how to properly fund um, its ongoing maintenance. That's an issue that a few members have raised uh, this afternoon. We should recognise that active travel needs to work alongside public transport. Commuters often uh, have to be able to walk or cycle to bus stops and train stations. This also means providing suitable and secure bike storage so that people are comfortable leaving bikes when they make their onward journeys. It means increasing the bike spaces we have on trains and buses so they can be used at the other end of the journeys. This is, um, Christine Graham highlighted this in our own region. Um, too often, I think, people who are trying to get around the country find that they can't access the public transport mode with their uh, bikes. Behaviour change programmes are a key part of encouraging people to change their travel habits. In my own region, organisations like Greener Kirkcaldy, who I visited recently, are working with the community to deliver sustainable change, including through walking festivals, cycle rides and training, and in bike repairs and services. And services like Dr Bike are out and about in the community, making it easier for people to access the help they need to get on two wheels, removing barriers to participation. And I was pleased that, um, that my own bike was recently made uh, fit for the road again by Dr Bike when he visited our offices in Loch Ely. And when it comes to increasing participation, there needs to be more targeted action to change behaviours. We need to see an improvement in the data collected on active transport and gender, for example. But we already know that men are much more likely to cycle than women. We know that active travel for children getting to schools is declining. We know that access to active travel is often divided along economic lines or by rural and urban areas. So we need to see initiatives which target particular groups and encourage um, a modal shift for them. And sometimes it's not actually a modal shift. I think we have to recognise, I think it's points that Mercedes uh, Vialba made. It's not always a modal shift because we're talking sometimes about people who don't have cars. Um, you know, in, in our leave and mouth area, I represent it's one of the lowest car ownerships um, in the country. And it's about facilitating those people to be more active. Uh, Behaviour change is not just about encouraging more people to walk or cycle. Cycling Scotland's annual Give, space, uh, Give Cycle Space campaign is running at the moment and it highlights some of the challenges that need to be addressed. They surveyed over 500 drivers who do not cycle themselves and while 97% agreed that people drive too closely to cyclists are putting lives at risk, over a third admit that they don't think of someone cycling as a person. 
Rather, they are focused on getting past or on with their journey. Um, that is a frightening thought for anyone who is thinking about cycling. Segregated lanes are not always available and they're not always well maintained. And nor are they required to be used by bikes even when they're available. And I think that point was made earlier about Holyrood Park. So in my region, the connectivity project for Leaven is seeking to transform provision for walking, wheeling and cycling in the Leavenmouth area, including upgrading around 24 kilometres of existing roads and paths, of which 10 kilometres will be segregated from vehicles. The benefits of increasing active travel are huge, but to secure those benefits needs consistent and improved support for local authorities to deliver the necessary infrastructure, alongside behavioural change programmes which enable people to make changes to their transport habits. The funds announced today are welcome, and while there are advantages to a bidding process, we do need to see sustainable funding. I'll close by welcoming the UCI Cycling World Championships coming to Scotland later this year. I look forward to seeing the road race taking place in various parts of my region, as well as the trial they'll be in Stirling. And I'd be keen to hear more from the Minister on how the Scottish Government is working to not just encourage more people to choose active travel for such events, but to generate that all-important active travel legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I now call John Swinney to be followed by Mark Russell around uh, six minutes. Mr. Swinney. Thank you, President Officer. And I welcome this uh, debate and commend the Minister on the personal energy that he brings to this important topic. And I know from my extensive discussions with him over the course of the period in which he's been involved in government how uh, seriously he takes these issues and is providing the commitment and the leadership to advance this agenda. One of the comments that the Minister made in his opening remark was that we had to make it easier and safer for active travel. And I think the more we think about how that can be turned into a practical reality, the better we will serve the interests of this policy agenda. Because I think from my own experience, I, I took part in a, a local cycling exercise in the city of Perth. It's a place I don't normally cycle. I normally cycle in country areas uh, on very quiet roads. I did find the experience of cycling in the city of Perth very unnerving because of the interplay of uh, fast-moving uh, traffic and volumes of traffic. So I think there are significant obstacles to people feeling that it is safe to, to cycle in particular contexts, and that should underpin a lot of our thinking, because this all matters in achieving the contribution of getting people out of cars and onto other modes of transport, which will help to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Of course, I can wait. Uh, Mark Ruskell. Mr Swinney, for, for giving way, and I, I share his experience of, um, of the, the difficulties in cycling around Perth. Would he agree with me that it hasn't helped that the local council, of course, there has taken out a number of cycle lanes over time, and that's made the streets potentially more dangerous? John well, I think, I think that, is, that is a concern. I know it's, I'm going to come on to talk about some local issues in, uh, in the Perthshire area where I think my council colleagues are now taking the initiative back to make sure that we have a much more sustained approach to secure greater levels of participation in cycling and active travel because that is essential to reduce the contribution to emissions. One of the key points in the government's agenda, very much at the heart of what the minister's agenda is all about is about the, the creation of a common purpose agenda between the government, local authorities, regional transport partnerships and communities. Uh, because the government can't do this all on its own and it's not, it's not appropriate to land all this on the government because many of these decisions have to be taken at local level. Which makes the, the, the stance that the Conservative Party has taken in the debate today just a little bit odd because the amendment that Graham Simpson is putting forward will delete the reference to the very active levels of investment in local authority provision that the Minister is making today. So, you know, having made a plea for the government to support local authorities with funding, the Conservatives now want us to pass a rather silly amendment which would actually take out reference to that particular point. Um, the, the Mercedes Vialba made a very strong point about the importance of improving air quality. But the intervention I wanted to make on her was, to, to, uh, was for her to answer my bewildered question about what on earth the Glasgow Labour Party was doing in the run-up to the introduction of the Glasgow Low Emissions Zone last week of suddenly saying they thought there were problems with it, having had a manifesto commitment to deliver it. Now, I don't, I, I don't cite these examples to 
it, it unnecessarily make trouble for myself in a parliamentary debate because I'm always trying to bring people together yeah, in this yeah. chamber. But I do think these are stunning examples of the problem that we face, that the minister faces, and the whole climate action agenda faces of getting people to establish some degree of consistency between our vigorous strategic agreement about the importance of tackling climate change and the specific things we've got to do about it on the ground. Yeah. And I cite deposit return scheme. There's a massive problem with that. That becomes an obstacle. Workplace parking levy, we can't do that. All the other things that get cited. And here we are in an active travel debate. And the minister's putting money on the table to try to help things forward and folk are moaning about it. Now look, we've got to get... Oh, oh, well, since I was, since I was inciting... The, um, the principal source of the mourning and the complaining today, I must give way to Mr Absolutely. Simpson. Graham Simpson. Can I just point out to John Swinney that at no point in my contribution did I moan or complain about anything Patrick Harvey said. In fact, I, but perhaps he would recognise that I started my contribution by saying that I agreed with what Patrick Harvey had been saying. Um, uh, and if only uh, Mr Swinney could adopt that tone, it would be all the better. John Swinney, I can give you the time back. I'm, I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. I, I, I'm just trying to encourage people to establish a relationship between our strategic commitment to tackling climate change and actually being prepared to do something about it on the ground. And that's the point I'm making out. Let me move on to some of the local issues I said to Mr Ruskell that I would talk about. And one of the very good examples I see locally in my constituency is how developments have taken place that have enabled active travel. So, for example, when the Perth Flood Defence Scheme was put in place, an extensive cycling network was put in place off-road around the North Muirton area. It's a wonderful access to the city. That will be complemented when the completion of the cross-tail link route. Now, I know that Mr Ruskell is not a fan of that particular development, but it will create a park and choose space where people can park their cars and then choose how they access the city from quite far out of the city in rural areas. I make a plea to the Minister, as I did when he came to visit my constituency, for the government to look seriously at community aspirations for stronger regulation to enable communities to be able to access land for community projects for active travel development. I've got a number of examples, uh, particularly in the um, Cooper Angus, Blair Gowrie, Ailith Triangle, where great community groups want to establish cycleways, but they are thwarted by their lack of ability to make progress on land acquisition or even land access issues where public authorities will have stronger powers than community organisations. Another venture, uh, presiding officer, I, I visited constituents the other week there where we cycled along the cycle route beside the A90 dual carriageway between Perth and Dundee on the stretch between Walnut Grove and St Meadows. This is quite literally a pavement at the side of the A90. When you cycle along it, even for somebody of sturdy determination, it is quite daunting and intimidating. So I think we've got to think about how we can develop spaces and routes. And St Meadows is a growing commuter community to the city of Perth. It's got an opportunity for people to use that for access to the city, but the infrastructure is just not quite there. And I've written to the Transport Minister on that particular issue, and I do hope the Minister today will engage on that question. I think the government is taking the right steps. I welcome very much the investment that has been announced by the government today and the commitment to active travel. And I do th hope it helps us to make the modal shift that is necessary to support our ambitions on climate change. Thank you, Mr Swinney. I now call Mark Ruskell to be followed by John Mason again around six minutes. Mr Ruskell. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, can I welcome this debate coming after a World Bicycle Day on Saturday when we celebrated what the Dutch, I believe, call Fietzgeluk, or bicycle happiness, um, a state perhaps uh, typified by uh, Graham Simpson uh, and uh, his rambling journeys uh, around the countryside, together with his lead-out man, uh, Brian Whittle. Um, now, it's clear that the record-breaking levels of investment to create dedicated spaces where we can walk, wheel, and ride in safety is, is starting to deliver. If we build it, 
and they will come. And very encouraged to hear the announcement of the Transformation Fund today by the Minister, which I think is really going to help to build that capacity in local councils that, that has been dwindling in recent years. Um, so in Stirling, for example, um, we've already heard um, from, from Evelyn Tweed with some Stirling examples, but you know, we, we have the new railway station concourse that's been put in place and the routes around town and out to the university. And they are the most significant step in redesigning the transport infrastructure of the city that we've seen in over a generation. I know that the minister recently visited Stirling. Um, and those green shoots that are starting to appear around the country now really are a testament to the work of a movement that has been relentless in its goal to reclaim the streets for people. And I'd like to, in particular, pay tribute to Ian Finlay, who was such a wonderful advocate uh, and an inspiration personally to me and many others uh, who, who joined him in that important mission. Now, the, the debate on active travel, of course, is about much more than just simple modes of transport. It's ultimately about designing places that are friendlier, safer and healthier, places that feel accessible regardless of your mobility, your age, your income or even your ability to drive. Places that are nice to spend time in green, beautiful and sociable spaces. But of course, we can ask people to walk, wheel and cycle. We can train and support them to do so as well. But if the streets are dangerous, if pavements are blocked, if traffic is too congested and too fast, then they will not. And even segregated infrastructure can't possibly join up every single journey from door to door. And I think a key litmus test here is our schools, because if young people and their families living within just a couple of miles find it difficult to walk, wheel, cycle, then we clearly need intervention and investment. So the streets where we live, work and play have to also feel safer, where the car is a guest and a polite and respectful one at that. And getting the foundations right is vital. And I want to highlight two simple national interventions that I think will be transformational for communities across Scotland. And that's 20 mile an hour speed limits and the enforcement of pavement parking. Um, two issues that I have to say I've enjoyed working closely with Kevin Stewart on over the last couple of months. And I, I you know, very much wish him, wish him well for the future. Now, traffic speed is often cited as the biggest barrier to cycling. And 20 mile an hour is the right maximum speed for the majority of roads where motor vehicles mix with pedestrians, wheelers and cyclists. And of course, for every one mile an hour reduction average speed, there is between a 4 and 6% reduction in road casualties, real lives that are being saved. Now, the extensive Borders Council pilot has shown conclusively that 20 mile an hour benefits both urban and rural communities. And of course, they're popular too. So no sooner has one community switched to 20 then others demand to go 20 as well. Now, some members might remember that in 2019, I moved a member's bill to make 20 mile an hour the norm in Scotland. And although that bill did not pass at the time, progress has been made since then. The Welsh Government passed an almost identical measure, and as a result, the majority of Welsh roads that are currently 30 will have flipped to 20 by September this year. And in Scotland, all appropriate roads will be designated as 20 mile an hour by 2025, Councils have been asked to draw up similar detailed plans to Welsh councils for implementation, and some, such as Highland Council, have already led the way and are rolling out 20s across 116 communities early on before that deadline. Now, in Stirling, the council hopes to complete the full rollout of 20 mile an hour by the end of this coming year, with only four communities yet to have those limits installed. But there is still some way to go, and it is critical that in the absence of a national legislative change, as we've seen in Wales, that all councils commit to implementation at the same time scale, so the benefits of national communication and rollout can be achieved, and that funding is provided by the Scottish Government. Now, I've found that 20 mile an hour rollout often triggers a community conversation about how we can make our streets safer. And the rollout of pavement parking enforcement, I hope, will do the same. Because the daily frustration felt by so many when vehicles block pavements is a barrier that many of us don't fully understand until we're pushing a child's buggy or we walk alongside friends who use a wheelchair. So I urge everyone with a stake in their community safety to respond to the current Transport Scotland consultation on enforcement. Presiding officer, this summer we're going to see the power of the bike across Scotland. Incredible moments and memories will be made through the Cycling World Championships. 
But I also hope that the legacy of that will be greater awareness as well as greater participation. Cycling as a sport is one of the great levelers. And while heroes like Wout van Aert have already been seen training on the roads around Stirling ahead of the championship, there's nothing to stop mere mortals like you and me, presiding officer, from hopping on a bike and joining him on the same roads. But another cycling hero, record-breaking Christina McKenzie, was knocked off her bike last September while out training on those same roads around Stirling. The driver didn't stop and has not been caught. And Christina has made a recovery, but for too many others, a ghost bike by the side of the road is a lasting reminder of recklessness and tragedy. So I do think that a fitting legacy for these first combined cycling world championships held here in Scotland would be the delivery of a long-awaited dash cam portal from Police Scotland. And I urge the government to help make this happen. And I look forward to a summer of feats galook as we continue our journey towards becoming a safe and confident nation of cyclists, wheelers and walkers. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. And I now call John Mason to be followed by Russell Finlay. Mr. Mason. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this debate. Uh, I do strongly believe in active travel. However, if you want a confession at the start of my speech, I have never really enjoyed cycling, so I will be concentrating on walking for most of what I have to say today. One aspect of active travel is walking, as is cycling, in order to get to public transport, be that a bus or a train. But those of us who actually have a car have to make the conscious decision whether to use it or not for a particular journey. For example, on Saturday, I was at a Baptist Union of Scotland event at Larbert High School, and I could have done the journey by car from home in about half an hour. However, I decided to combine walking and the train, partly so that I could read my committee papers on the way, as say, time in a car is wasted time, and I am fortunate to have a local station within 10 minutes, and Queen Street Station is excellent nowadays for changing between the low and the high levels. I then had a 20-minute walk from the station in Larbert to the school, and much the same on the way back. But it did mean that it took me roughly one and a half hours to get there and nearly two hours to get back. So in this example, it was between three and four times as long a journey compared to using the car. Now, that was fine for me, and I felt I used the time well. Eh, and I had, as well as that, much more exercise than if I'd used the car. And so certainly I felt better and definitely slept better eh, that night. But I do think this is one of the key factors in comparing how to travel. It's not just about, quote, shorter everyday journeys, unquote, as the motion suggests. That is certainly one factor. But it's also important how much longer proportionately walking or cycling and public transport can take. If I take the car to church on Sunday, it's about five minutes. If I walk, it is 20 minutes. That is a factor of four times. But actually, longer journeys are more competitive. For example, if I go to the SNP conference in Aberdeen by train, it will, be very much, it will not be very much different time-wise from taking the car. Therefore, I would suggest that while short local journeys eh, are not necessarily the best starting point for getting people out of their cars, they clearly are important. Although I said I would... Right, I lost my place there. I'm usually in two pages. Sorry. Although I said I would focus on walking, I'm happy to mention cycling as well. We are, we are seeing tremendous increase in dedicated cycle lanes in Glasgow, and the Council is to be commended for that. I gather that there has been £3.6 million investment through the Places for Everyone programme to encourage walking, wheeling and cycling in Glasgow. Just in my own constituency, London Road is seeing considerable ongoing work, so that there will soon be cycle lanes most of the way from Bridgeton Cross out to Dildowie along London Road. And that is on top of some great existing routes, such as the walking and cycling path along the Clyde from Carmyle to Glasgow Green. Safety is another factor in all of this, not least around schools, as I think has been mentioned already. There have been various attempts to encourage young people to walk or cycle to school, but the number still being taken by car should cause us a lot of concern. Maybe the parents are en route somewhere else, and it is easier to drop the kids off on the way. But the effect is to make it more dangerous for all the other kids going to that school, be it the vehicles themselves or if traffic fumes or whatever. 
Again, in Glasgow, there have been attempts to create exclusion zones near primary schools around 9am and 3pm to prevent vehicles coming right up to the school gates. If memory serves me correctly, this was piloted in Haddington, and I am enthusiastic about the concept. But in Glasgow, at least, these zones do not seem to be enforced much, if at all, and so they can be ignored by determined parents. And safety on both roads and pavements is the responsibility of us all. I frequently see adult cyclists riding far too fast on the pavements, and the impatience of many pedestrians to cross the road without waiting for the green signal is just asking for accidents to happen. On the other hand, if we do want to encourage more walking, we need to make pedestrian crossings respond more quickly when the button to cross is pushed to change the lights. If you have to press the button and then wait for ages until the lights stop the traffic, it is no wonder that people are put off walking or to take risks crossing the road. If we are serious about putting pedestrians ahead of cars and lorries, then cars and lorries need to wait longer at red lights. Can I also say something about what I believe are some of the other benefits of walking? One is clearly physical health, and if we want to tackle obesity and some of our other health issues, then more physical exercise, including walking, is very much part of the answer. Then again, there's importance of mental health. In our offices here at Holyrood, we each have thinking pods in our offices. Although I'm not actually sure if cabinet secretaries and ministers actually have these. Mr Swinney is indicating they don't. However, I confess that I do not use my thinking pod for thinking, but I use it as a shelf for storing papers. Uh, no, more positively, if I want to think or reflect or even pray, I would rather go out for a walk. We have the Salisbury Crags and Arthur's Seat on our doorstep, and it was up there that I reflected and prayed back in 1983 uh, to dedicate three of years of my life to Nepal. We are all different, but walking can make a huge difference to our mental health as well as to our physical health. And I think that would very much be the message from groups like Paths for All, who are active in my constituency and elsewhere. I just saw one of their tweets yesterday, and they, sa they said, eh, quote, walking or wheeling can offer valuable time to A, catch up with a friend or loved one, B, boost your mood and reduce anxiety, C, connect you to your local community and services, D, offer you valuable time in nature. So all in all, I hope we can very much support today's motion. Yes, the government and our local councils can do a certain amount, investing in cycle lanes, paths, low emission zones, etc. But we all have a part to play, MSPs and citizens at large. How many of us have cars sitting in the Parliament car park which do not need to be there? Could we leave them at home next week and come here using a combination of public transport and active travel? Let's set an example. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I now call Russell Finlay to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Um, when I agreed to speak about active travel, I wasn't even sure what active travel was. And I'm sure that many people out there probably don't really understand what the term actually means. But having looked it up, it turns out I'm a big fan of active travel. Every single day I jump on my bike and then catch a train to and from Parliament, and in doing so, I dash past the ranks of chauffeur-driven, gleaming government limos, which are often sitting. Yes, I will. Ben McPherson. That was quick. I, I think I should inform Mr. Finlay and the benefit of others in the chamber and more widely that the Scottish government has never had limousines, and actually, a lot of ministers in their time have chosen to come to work by walking, by bicycle, and by other modes of transport. So. I just think such phrases as uh, the one that Mr Finlay has just used are a disservice to him and uh, the wider political debate. Russell Finlay. I, I thank the former minister for his intervention. Um, I must be imagining things. There are cars waiting, whether they are called limousines or whatever uh, name you want to give them, and they are for the purpose of taking ministers to and from official business. Um, now, to be fair, um, at least one minister does also frequently use a bike, and that, of course, is Patrick Harvey. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about cycling. And I want to put on the record that, just like Mr Simpson, Mr Whittle, and indeed Mr Harvey, I am also not a mammal. Um, however, I am slightly perplexed at Patrick Harvey's reluctance to wear a helmet. Uh, during a bike safety course, the children taking part wore head protection, 
but not the Minister who has reportedly said there is no evidence that helmets make cycling safer or that they are only of value in a learning setting and, most intriguing of all, that they are not his style. So, my, my, and I have seen Mr Harvey in the streets of Glasgow and my heart sometimes is in my mouth as I see him dodge and weave through the traffic in Partick. And just last month, the Minister politely declined the offer of a gifted helmet from a newspaper. And I think it is vitally important that people do wear helmets, because I have had a couple of crashes in my time. Once, when I was a child, I had a head-on collision with a lamppost, which might explain something, and there were no helmets in those days. And almost two years ago, I had another crash, and I think, had I not been wearing a helmet, I would almost certainly have suffered quite a serious injury. I will. Thank you. Minister. I am grateful to the member for giving way and without wanting to cast aspersions on the motivation of the right wing press in, in that particular stunt that they, they undertook. Uh, I hope that the, the party that often casts itself as a supporter of individual liberty will respect the fact that this is a matter of individual choice. I fully respect the member's uh, decision to make his choice to wear a helmet. Uh, if that makes him feel safer, I hope he respects mine. Russell Finlay. I absolutely respect the Minister's right to make that choice, but, and I, I don't expect he would necessarily uh, want to listen to a Tory on the subject, but he might listen to the brain injury charity Headway, who say, and I quote, using negative language that discourages the use of helmets puts lives at risk. And I think as a Minister, there's a great deal of responsibility in that respect. Yeah. Uh, now, presiding officer, today's Scottish Government motion and our party's amendment refers to the UCA Cycling Championships in Glasgow in August, which will be the world's biggest ever cycling event. Now, a UCI team recently came into Parliament with a fixed bike in which MSPs all competed. One SNP minister pedalled with such gusto that he ripped his trousers. A Labour MSP sat on top of the leaderboard for two days, then had another go when he was toppled. I will not name those two. And I'm also far too modest to, to mention who took gold. Suffice to say, it was a, a rare Tory win in this place. Um, I also hope that when the UCI does come to Glasgow, that the SNP Council will do something about the state of the roads. We don't have potholes in Glasgow. We've got craters that look sometimes more like a lunar landscape. And a Cycling Scotland survey has found that one of the main barriers for people taking up cycling are concerns about road safety. And everywhere you look around Glasgow, you see significant sums of money appearing to be spent on improving active travel and cycling. But I believe sometimes the results can actually make journeys more dangerous. I will give you an example. The rubber delineators, they are called, that separate cycling lanes from the main road are, I believe in themselves, uh, can be a hazard. And in addition, this causes the cycle lanes to become very narrow, which then in turn can become choked with rubbish and other debris, which I think is quite hard to clear with the equipment the councils have, therefore making the lanes, the cycle lanes, quite dangerous to use and pushing cyclists back onto the road. Now, some councils also spend a lot of money. I will, yes. Sarah Boyack. I think it is interesting because if we are using space that is currently road space, and reinventing it as cycle spaces, you have limited choices. So there are different ways you can do it. You can just have a, a line on a road and keep your fingers crossed that everybody sticks by it, or you can use the type of infrastructure that started going in during uh, COVID. Um, and you're right about repairs, maintenance and cleaning, but we do have to look at the choices because with the nature of our roads, we don't have unlimited options. Russell Finlay. I don't have a great deal of time, but in short, it does seem to be pretty chaotic and not really joined up the thinking behind a lot of this stuff. Um, now, I want to quickly turn to some of the Scottish Government's record on active travel. Um, take, for example, the access bike scheme, which saw the Government facilitate loans for people to get a bike in credit. Last time we checked, just four people had applied, which works out at a cost of around £35,000 per bike. The SNP Government also set a target for 10 per cent of all journeys to be taken by bike by 2020, but the following year this was just sitting at 2.8 per cent. And the SNP Government also pledged to cut car miles by 20 per cent by 2030. Yet from 2015 to 2020 
Miles driven by cars in Scotland went up by 8%. So to conclude, the SNP government often talk a good game of active travel. Their, their motion today, I believe, is an exercise in self-congratulation. And the truth is, they routinely miss targets, fail to deliver flagship schemes, while also cutting funding, as other speakers will undoubtedly attest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Ben McPherson to be followed by Rona Mackay. Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome today's debate and the motion. And I do so as somebody who's had a driving licence since I was a teenager, but has decided since then not to own a car. I speak today as somebody who loved riding a bike when I was a child and at university, but haven't had a bike since then. But I'm somebody who walks every day and runs very often too. So I want to focus my remarks today on the pedestrian experience and how important active travel is for pedestrians, particularly in urban environments like my constituency of Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. For those able, as the motion highlights, the benefits to health and well-being of walking are well known and well understood. I walk to work every day, along with utilising the wonderful Lothian buses, and I know um, bus travel is something we will discuss at other points in this, in this Parliament. And the benefits of, particularly in a city like Edinburgh, taking in the environment, the hustle and bustle, the vibrancy, the beautiful landscapes is a real, a real joy. And of course, in a, a, an area like this, the, the experience of walking is different to others, and I respect that, but I want to, to focus on, on, on what it's like here in the capital city. And as I walked to work uh, this morning, thinking about what to say in today's debate, I thought about the fact that in decades past, particularly in the 1970s, there was a plan for a sixth lane inner city ring road in this city. It would have devastated our capital city's aesthetic value. The Pleasance, Toll Cross, Haymarket, Dean Valley, Stockbridge, Inverleith, Cannon Mills and the top of Leith Walk would have all been changed and much of them would have been demolished to facilitate this inner city ring road and a world heritage site would perhaps never have been realised. I highlight this uh, not just because my family was involved in the campaign against it, but also because it's important for learning lessons. Learning lessons of the fact that the car's importance, particularly for those with accessibility issues or for those in different parts of the country where distances are longer is, is really important. Um, but at that time, the car was thought of as the absolute future. Uh, and infrastructure for the car being able to be utilised by as many people as possible was uh, at the forefront of people's minds. And this six-lane inner city ring road was, as the council at the time sought to impose it on the people of Edinburgh against their wishes. And indeed, the party in power at that time in the city has never been back in power. And I say that because the comparison is not the same. But we should keep in mind that we always want to take people with us. So while, thankfully, the car did not win uh, the day in that we, we maintained the integrity of the city for walkers and, and everyone to enjoy, as we implement our active travel ambitions, we also need to take people with us. And I absolutely appreciate the point in the motion around um, making sure that we undertake transformation at pace, but I would caution that that pace isn't too fast, because there is a job to do in order to make sure we persuade. And part of that's about narrative, part of it's about perception. But the more that people feel that this is about encouraging them to do differently and to act differently and to give them the facilities to do that rather than reducing car use, 
I think the more progress we will make together. Yes, certainly. Brian Hussle. I really appreciate Ben McPherson giving way. And listening to his speech intently, I, 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 I do appreciate his speech. But uh, would he agree with me that what we, it's, it's, okay, it's okay to go quickly? But, it, but it's not just about stopping people doing things. It's been making sure that in preventing them from doing one thing, we give them an alternative to do another thing, and that the change is made as simple as possible. Ben McPherson. I, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think part of it is about considering the different uh, stakeholders involved. So making sure, and as I know the minister does, there's engagement with uh, organisations who represent particular groups of people, say, for example, Inclusion Scotland and what they do in terms of representing the needs of disabled people, uh, the Federation for Small Businesses and the way that they represent the needs of small businesses. And I see all of this in my constituency of Edinburgh, Northern and Leith, and in particular, the considerations around the tram works, uh, which we're all delighted will be, uh, are complete and will be open tomorrow. And it's a great thing for Leith and I welcome it. But there's been a real challenge on Leith Walk now of accommodating five modes of transport. Uh, and I, I respect the decisions that councillors made in that regard. And I respect the officials for seeking to implement the policies decided. But actually as a pedestrian on Leith Walk, because of the new cycle lanes, it is a very different experience. And I just say that because there is a need for nuance and consideration between the different modes of active travel and how in time we get that right. Uh, and also thinking about the needs of businesses in order to receive deliveries uh, and able to function in that way. So I think we've made great progress. The investment is welcome. Um, if we can get the narrative as much into the positive as we can, then all the better. Uh, and let's uh, work together on this journey towards active travel to make our experience for people getting from A to B uh, as pleasant as possible, learn the lessons of the past, uh, and make sure that those health benefits uh, are realized in a way where we also respect the needs of, of different communities and, and, and how they uh, both need to facilitate their businesses, uh, but also uh, how, how different people's uh, different people's needs and uh, challenges in terms of how they travel is, is something we always need to keep in mind. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms McPherson. And I now call Rona Mackay, who will be the last speaker before we move to closing speeches. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Time is running out before the damage we are doing to our planet becomes catastrophic, and active travel is a huge part of how we mitigate that damage. All speakers here today have highlighted the positives of active travel, but as we've heard, the negatives are when consultation and inclusivity are not part of the planning when setting out strategies, and I'll talk about uh, that later in my contribution. Presiding officer, I'm proud that Scotland leads the UK in its active travel investment, punching above its weight as usual, especially following devastating Tory cuts in England. At £58 per head, Scotland's not just a UK leader on active travel spend, but a European leader as well. This compares to just £1 per head in England outside London. The Scottish Government has massively increased investment in active travel with almost £190 million in 2023-24, a major step towards the commitment of 10% of the transport budget by 2024-25. This confirms active travel's important role in meeting the Scottish Government's priorities, which are equality, opportunity, community and building a fairer, greener Scotland. And the Minister's announcement of this transformation fund is extremely welcome. The route map of how we get there contains over 30 interventions. Some of these have been delivered in the short term, including the groundbreaking free bus travel for under 22s. Other actions will take longer, and some will prove to be more challenging than others, and will need a mix of infrastructure, incentivisation and regulatory actions. A key milestone is the introduction of, introduction of low emission zones in four of Scotland's cities, the first of which in Glasgow is already in force as of this month, enhancing the quality of the environment and improving public health. Of course, changes to our daily life is difficult for everyone and there will be bumps along the way. But the importance of low emission zones in reaching our climate change targets cannot be overemphasised. Since the first low emission zone for buses was introduced in 2018, in Glasgow, uh, air pollution levels have, levels have dropped dramatically. 
Presiding officer, we know that active travel is not only good for the planet, it's good for our health and well-being as well, mentally and physical, physically, as John Mason uh, said. It can com combat obesity, heart disease and other serious illnesses related to inactivity. So the government has delivered a significant step up in investment in spaces where people can walk, wheel and cycle safely and ensured there are more spaces that put people first, not cars. And as someone who started walking much more since getting a new puppy this year, I already feel the benefits of regular walks in the countryside. My own local authority, Eastern Bartonshire, first published its, its active travel strategy in 2015 and has progressed significantly, significantly since then. However, it is true that several well-intentioned initiatives such as cycling lanes in Bears Den and shared space in Kirk and Tillich were not planned inclusively with road users, residents and disabled people, and that caused much concern. That was almost 10 years ago, and I am confident that the Council has learned those lessons as they go forward with their active travel strategy. The Council's current policy focuses on reducing car dependency. In Eastern Bartonshire, however, rates of car ownership are higher than the Scottish average and modal share for active travel, particularly cycling, is low. But I think there's real merit in the adage, as Mark Ruskell said, if you build it, they will come. Where there is more infrastructure for active travel, uh, that cycleway safely separated from the road, there are higher rates of active travel. In the Netherlands, for example, where active travel infrastructure is comprehensive, 30% of all journeys under five miles are cycled and 36% list the bicycle as their most frequent way of travelling. But as Evelyn Tweed pointed out, this infrastructure didn't happen by accident. It involved long-term planning, much investment and attention to all aspects of how it would affect everyday life and, of course, public transport investment. In Seville, where extensive cycling infrastructure has been constructed recently, rates of cycling have skyrocketed with an 11-fold increase in the number of cycling journeys following the creation of a comprehensive 120-kilometre network of cy cycling infrastructure. The Eastern Bartonshire Travel Survey, Survey clearly illustrates an opportunity for increasing tra active travel in the area. However, the survey identifies the main barriers to active travel are safety, convenience and carrying things. The Scottish Household Survey found that 70% of Eastern Bartonshire residents agree climate change is an urgent problem and two-thirds believe their actions and behaviour contribute to climate change. Um, John Mason spoke of parents driving uh, children to school and it reminded me of when I was used to do, drop my own son off and, and I'm ashamed to say I was one of those many cars sitting outside schools and now I think things have improved dramatically. The Hands Up for Scotland School Travel Survey provides modal share data for school travel in Eastern Bartonshire between 2012 and 2021, and it found that walking and cycling increased marginally to 45% and 2.5% respectively. Uh, the car use decreased by 3% to 23%, so still a long way to go. Eastern Bartonshire, of course, has an ageing demographic, and this must be taken into account when considering active travel. And I agree with many of the points that Ben McPherson was making there about, you know, everyone has to be taken into consideration, and, and those that are able should, should um, benefit from it. But we must take everybody, everybody circumstances into account. So, presiding officer, this is an evolving picture, and nationally and, and globally, um, we're sure of this. Unless we embrace active travel, which of course must be supported by the correct investment to provide the infrastructure needed, we will continue to destroy the planet for future generations. And I certainly don't want that in my conscience. I suspect none of us does. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mackay. And we will now move to closing speeches. And I call on Sarah Boyack to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, I think it's been a mostly constructive debate around the table today. Um, and I think what's been really good is the mix of national targets, national ambitions, but also really strong local insights and focuses on individual communities and what's happening where we live. So I think it's actually about making sure we've got the national targets and the funding, but we also make sure the rollout is going to be as good as possible. And as everybody has basically said, active travel is absolutely central to delivering our health and well-being, keeping people active, potentially helping us address poor health, the rising obesity that many people experience, and some of the powerful statistics have been quoted by colleagues today. 
It is also critical if we are going to give people affordable and safe routes, whether it is services to school, education, retail or work. And it is as important as a key part of our sustainable travel ambitions that we have a joined up approach so that Scotland can meet its net zero targets and tackle the climate crisis, but is also, as Mercedes Villalba said, also support our nature recovery. Um, and I think the points about air pollution that she mentioned were really important as well. Um, and the final point, I was thinking about this this morning as I came in, as we move towards the summer holidays, it should be part of our tourist offer for people in Scotland, um, but also for people to come to Scotland, given the beauty, the hospitality our country offers. But if we're going to deliver on all our ambitions, we need the investment and we need the expertise right across the country in all of our councils, because that's been one of the critiques as we've gone through today's debate. They all need the knowledge, the staff and critically the funding to make it happen not just in existing communities, but it's one of the parts in our amendment where we've got new housing and, and developments that are taking place. We need to make sure that from day one, there are active travel options, walking, cycling, but also good bus investment. Because if we're going to give people the alternative to cars, it has got to be there from day one. Yeah. Sorry, is that a quick intervention? Christine Graham. It will be extremely brief. As I said in my own speech at Shawfair, where there's a large housing development, that's exactly what they're doing in Midlothian. The thing is, we've got thousands of, thousands of houses going up all over the country as we speak, and they all need to have that link. And we've got many houses that were not connected, because as Ben McPherson said, a lot of our towns and cities were effectively built around the car. So we need to make sure that we've got not just the ambition, but the investment. And uh, we thought the Scottish Government's motion... No, I need to get on. I've, I've taken a couple of interventions. It was a bit self-congratulatory, and it didn't address the key issues that put many people off cycling, which has actually been one of the themes of this discussion today, which is good. Um, if we look at making sure that children have safe access to cycling, that's partly about planning, it's partly about the infrastructure and our roads, but it's also about cheap or free access to bikes, and there are lots of community groups that are working really hard on this. I think the other thing I'd want to say is that we did have short-term investment during COVID, which made it easier to accommodate the increase in people walking and cycling as they worked from home or used their local communities for exercise and just getting out into a safe environment. But we need that to be ongoing investment in our communities right across the country. And I think the points that Claire Baker made about off-cycle spaces, on-off-cycle spaces, is really, really important. And it's making sure that when we are retrofitting existing roads, that it's as good as possible. And that's something that needs to happen. And you need the infrastructure at the local level. I think that there's a real point about potholes that's been mentioned quite a few times. That is dangerous for cyclists. I've had several crashes with potholes. And if it's at night, it's particularly hard to see potholes, especially when the lighting is not good. And I think there are particular issues uh, about uh, the condition of our paths and networks. Again, that was a point made by Claire Baker. That's critical for disabled people. But pavements, if we're going to have people walking as part of their everyday lives, we need to about think about people with crutches, with walking sticks, um, with people whose sight isn't perfect or who have no sight at all. And we need to make sure that our pavements are safe. And I have to say, I, I tested this out recently uh, when I was recovering from a broken ankle. The pavements are not good enough in a lot of our communities. So there's infrastructure repair and maintenance. Um, and I think the, the, the point that we put in our uh, motion about thinking through um, the different experiences people have, different communities are really important. So the points made by Beatrice Wishart about crowded roads putting off women in particular, I think that's important to take into mind. And I know from talking to Infra Sisters, which is a campaign group in the Lothians, that there are routes that women simply do not feel safe using. Um, and they will not do that for major parts of the year because we need better cycling um, and better lighting, particularly during the winter months, when basically um, people cannot cycle home safely at night. Um, and it's also some of our routes are not ideal for walking either. So we go back to the money. Our cash-strapped local authorities need the investment for our existing roads and pavements, which are not as safe as they should be, as well as putting in the new infrastructure, which is absolutely critical. And that's where more dedicated cycle spaces and routes to make people feel safer and encourage them to walk and cycle for more and more of their journeys. 
And that's a key issue that the Scottish Government needs to address if we're going to deliver on the ambition to reduce car travel by 20%. There was a really good cross-party group uh, sustainable transport report that I think is definitely worth the Minister reading. And I think it's about safe, affordable, reliable choices. We debated buses recently, and that's also part of the issue about moving to active travel, because it's about people walking part of the route, getting a bus for part of the route. It's about people coming into our towns and cities with better options. So park and ride on the edge of the city, and then having faster routes into town for buses, and also better routes for cycles. And if you try Google Maps sometimes in Edinburgh and Glasgow, it can be faster to cycle a lot of those routes, definitely faster than buses. And when you think about parking, it can be as close as, as driving. So I think there's a culture shift we need to deliver. And we need to make sure that we have employers helping deliver that culture change and think about the public sector as employers. So in this place, cycling is definitely encouraged, but you've not got a lot of space downstairs. So you need to have the infrastructure now and in the future. Um, I think there's been a superb amount of work and members across the chamber have talked about people who work in our communities to give people access to active travel, whether it's voluntary organisations like Elrec and my own city, giving people from ethnic minority communities access to walking and cycling, confidence and social opportunities, or the bike station who I met at the weekend, which helps give people access to affordable bikes teaches them how to look after them, which I found very useful, repair skills, but they've also got a bike library. So that enables parents to pass on the bike when it's not big enough for their kid anymore, but get a new one. And those kind of projects are crucial. So there's much more we need to do, and it cannot be on off. The 10% target is critical going forward, because we've been debating cycling in this parliament for over two decades now. This is not something new. And the the thing that is going to shift is when we move to electric vehicles. They are going to be really expensive to buy. Bikes are slightly more expensive, but cars, we need active travel in place now. And we need interchanges for buses, for trains, and decent Ms. routes Ms. Boyack, could I please ask you to bring It's a now to issue. It's not for 10 years hence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyack. I now call on Liam Kerr to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Around eight minutes, please. Thank you. Presiding officer, notwithstanding John Swinney's contribution, there was much positivity during this afternoon's debate. Yeah. Members have queued up to recognise the benefits of active travel, such as lower likelihood of conditions such as diabetes and hypertension, uh, mental health benefits, cleaner air, the promotion of environmentally friendly behaviours and benefits for the community, such as reduced traffic congestion. And Sustrans added in a Persuasive submission, the reduced cancer-related mortality risk from regular cycling and a reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease. And Friends of the Earth Scotland flagged the economic argument, saying a major investment in public transport could create around 22,000 direct jobs and 416,000 indirect jobs, while Mercedes Bialba raised that it can save money. So the case for more active travel has been made out. And as Graham Simpson said at the outset, all of us in this chamber back greater investment in active travel. However, the debate has introduced some caveats to that positivity, because what has also come across this afternoon are questions around how prepared the Scottish Government is to actually deliver this. I must say, it actually started even before the debate, with the Minister inserting a rather snarky false equivalence with the rest of the UK, something which he doubled down on, on an intervention on Graham Simpson. And then, in an otherwise useful and interesting contribution, particularly around planning by Fiona Hislop, she randomly started having a go at the UK Government. But you see, the unamended motion talks about the government's commitment to reduce car kilometres by 20% by 2030. But the motion fails to mention that the Scottish Government have no idea how this will be achieved. And Russell Findlay yeah. actually flagged up that car kilometres have gone up in recent years. Brian Whittle flagged that the government has started with reducing cars before dealing with high quality neighbourhoods and public transport, which might go some way to explaining this. And all of that was brought home in that 
even though we heard from Graham Simpson that the CPG on sustainable transport produced a report on this in November with five recommendations, when I asked the Net Zero Cabinet Secretary exactly one month ago in committee how the Scottish Government intended to meet the target to reduce car kilometres by 20%, she said she wouldn't have any detail until the draft climate change plan in November. So at the moment, there is no idea, no plan, and I'm afraid, no chance. Which is why our amendment demanding the Scottish Government set out in detail how it plans to achieve the 20% reduction is so important. I will. John Swinney. I'm grateful to Liam Kerr for giving way, Presiding Officer. Doesn't Mr Kerr think that the chances of achieving that objective might be helped by the £20 million transformation fund going directly to local authorities and regional transport partnerships. And that's the very wording that his silly amendment is trying to delete. Liam Kerr. What I would say to John Swinney is, yes, of course money is going to help, but you cannot do that, the government cannot do that, without a plan. And the problem is that the government, of which he was deputy minister for so long, comes to this chamber with no plans, and that's why it will fail. I'll make some progress, please. Many members... How long have I got? Uh, you can get the time back. Yes. John I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Liam Kerr for, for giving way, because I think his reaction to my point illustrates one of the dilemmas here. On the one hand, the Conservatives come here unprepared to increase tax, but wanting more spending. They come here demanding that we empower local authorities, and then they demand we tell them what to do. Doesn't that just tell Parliament the Conservatives are hypocrites on these issues? Dean Kerr. I'm afraid that rather confused intervention uh, from Mr Swinney can be responded to very simply by saying, cut to the waste, come back with a plan, and then maybe we can actually deliver a 20% reduction. <laughs> Presiding officer, Many members, including Beatrice Swishart, brought up the very modest rise in cycling, and she and others flagged the state of the roads, not potholes, but craters, according to Russell Finlay, and asked how on earth we can encourage people to cycle, to walk, when they're in that state. We can't. And the evidence for that was a contribution from Christine Graham. She tried cycling, but was knocked off and lost confidence. And I'm afraid that is it's a very powerful contribution and all too common. And the minister rightly said in his opening that if we want to increase active travel, it has to be easier. I will. Christine Graham. I'm, I'm delighted you were concerned for my well-being, but it wasn't a pothole, it was a motorist. Ooh. Liam Kerr. Forgive me, I thought I'd said that. I was talking about the dangers on the, on the road, but thank you for the clarification. Because what the minister was saying in his opening was that if we want to increase active travel, it has to be easier and safer yeah. to walk, scoot or cycle to school. And he suggested, rightly, some modifications. Yet one of the biggest challenges that we've heard about faced by councils when helping to deliver active travel schemes is the fact that these can be big ticket items at a time when they've never been more starved of resources, as the Labour amendment, which we'll vote for, makes clear. Yeah. And it was flagged to us in the submission from Sustrans, which was highlighted by Brian Whittle, that councils not only lack central government funding, but also have difficulties in securing match funding required to be shortlisted, requ that's required to be shortlisted for projects. And then, as the Net Zero Committee found, there is a uh, jarring Members, could we have less sedentary commentary, please, Mr Kerr? Which can happen between ring fence spending and properly funding public services. Now, we had examples throughout the afternoon, but in the North East region, Angus Council has a £60 million black hole in its finances and it's currently considering whether to spend tens of millions of ring fenced Transport Scotland money to turn old railway tracks into footpaths where people have been walking for decades but meanwhile can't afford to lift trees that fell and blocked the Crombie country path 19 months ago in Storm Arwen. But that's hardly surprising given that my Per my intervention earlier, the Scottish Government doesn't know how much it needs to deliver this. The Minister's response to my question, how much is needed to achieve what we need, was the sky's the limit, which is extraordinary given they've quantified £33 billion to decarbonise buildings. So when it wants to, it can quantify this. 
And I think, therefore, the government does need to put in the work that Evelyn Tweed said we needed to achieve what we all want. The final point is one that I don't think featured enough today, but was brought up by Beatrice Wishart and a couple of others. It's easy to talk about active travel and more public transport use in central belt cities, but it's not so easy in rural Aberdeenshire, Ayrshire or Angus. If the government wants active travel and to get behaviour change, it has to address the issue set out in the submission from Closer, that urban residents were significantly more likely to engage in active travel than rural residents, and these should therefore be considered separately in relation to outcomes and policy decisions. So, President Officer, we absolutely back the sentiment of the debate today, and we associate ourselves with the positive comments of the Minister and the aims and objectives, but we must recognise the challenges inherent in achieving this. The challenges to councils as delivery partners, the challenges from government aims not backed up by plans and funding, and the challenges of ensuring we treat different groups of people, such as rural dwellers and those with protected characteristics, in a bespoke manner. That's what the amendment in Graham Simpson's name seeks to do, and that's why it should be supported. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kerr. And I now call on Minister Patrick Harvey uh, to close on behalf of the Scottish Government. And if the Minister were able to take us to decision time, that would be most helpful. Thank you. Could... Officer, thank you. Uh, let me begin, first of all, by thanking, of course, members for contributing to the debate today, and in particular to those members, uh, including Graham Simpson, Mercedes Vialba, uh, Beatrice Wishart, and Mark Ruskell, who chose to use part of their contribution to offer their best wishes to Kevin Stewart in light of his announcement today. I hope that's something that the whole chamber uh, will join together in, in wishing him very well uh, in uh, uh, recovering from the issues that he's been facing. It's clear also that there's uh, a broad consensus on the benefits that active travel can bring, even if uh, not all members are, are quite willing to accept the reality that this now comes with a higher level of political commitment and a higher level of funding than ever before. Uh, I won't have time to address every uh, member's contribution, but let me start with those uh, who were moving uh, amendments. Uh, Graham Simpson started uh, with a, a personal uh, example of how active travel can end up uh, supporting local businesses uh, with, uh, of one kind or another, uh, with a bit more cash going over their uh, tills. Uh, I think that's something that we need to recognise uh, that uh, not just a, a change of culture in our roads, uh, but something that can benefit small businesses when they see that greater footfall from active travel. Uh, he, he also reflected on the fact that we do need to see a change in driver behaviour in many parts uh, of the country. Uh, however, I have to say that much of his uh, amendment does delete uh, a significant amount of the motion, including uh, the recognition of the level of funding that we're putting in, uh, such as the Active Travel Transformation Fund, uh, so we, we won't be able uh, to support that amendment. I know that the Conservatives don't necessarily like uh, hearing fair comparisons with funding in the rest of the UK, but even in terms of Scottish uh, context, this is a higher level of commitment to Active Travel uh, than Scotland has seen by some margin. Uh, and the Scottish Government is determined to continue that. I'll certainly look into the specific local projects uh, that he mentioned, but it, it is relevant here that the clear commitment to long-term increased investments, such as the Active Travel Transformation Fund, direct to local authorities, this is something that will help them uh, to have confidence in increasing their capacity and skills to deliver active travel projects. Uh, Mercedes uh, Vialba, um, also offered support for our active travel objectives and I share uh, uh, her, her view uh, of the need for example to address congestion and air pollution. I hope uh, that we're all able to welcome the groundbreaking progress that's been made in putting the first low emission zone uh, into place. It will be only the first and it should be only the first. Uh, Mercedes Vialba also restated many of the multiple benefits from active travel, from reduced greenhouse gas emissions, improved road safety, nature recovery uh, that comes with quieter streets and cleaner air, public health, and much, much more. And our arguments on the cost of transport are important here as well. Let's recognise that while active travel is the cheapest way of getting about, if the cost of the repair that you face having to make to your bike 
uh, is so much more than the cost of tomorrow's bus ticket, it may f force you back onto a more expensive uh, and less accessible form of transport. So we need to make sure that we're uh, addressing that access to bikes issue as well. That's what this government, Scottish Government is taking forward. Members know that the free bikes pilot uh, was taken forward to develop the best models uh, of giving free bikes to young people because one size won't fit all. Uh, and we're also working with Bike for Good on the, the option of a bike subscription model. Uh, and later this year, uh, with Cycling UK, we'll be launching an open fund to support bike share schemes because there are multiple ways of giving people access to bikes, not just ownership. Uh, I do uh, have to say that her uh, amendment finishes... Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give way a uh, member at the back. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for giving way. It's just a really quick intervention. Would he acknowledge uh, that it, electronic bikes are a good way of getting folk onto bicycling that may uh, need a bit of nudging to get out outdoors? And will he also acknowledge that the bicycle was invented in Keir near Dumfries, which I think hasn't been mentioned today? Minister. I, I'm sure we can all recognise that the members uh, claim to, to fame for our community in, in that one. But yeah, e-bikes, uh, though they're not my first choice, uh, they're one of the many ways that we can increase the range of, uh, of bikes and active travel vehicles that people can access. Uh, uh, and uh, they have uh, potential not just for changing the way people move about, uh, but e-cargo bikes also have huge potential for changing the way that goods move about as well. The Labour Amendment... Uh, I'd say did finish with a point that we can't support. Uh, slightly unreasonably, I think, cherry-picking the data to compare active travel to school uh, with the previous year, which was the same report recognises strongly impacted by COVID. There was a particular impact from the pandemic uh, on uh, school travel. Uh, and so I don't think it's a reasonable comparison to make with that particular year. The fact is that we now have higher levels of active travel to school than pre-pandemic. And it's that long-term uh, uh, improvement, uh, that long-term trend that we are determined to continue uh, to, to make progress with. I just want to clarify, so is the Minister saying he's unable to support the amendment which notes a report and, and the findings in that report because he doesn't like the findings? Minister. Um, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly not because I don't like the findings. I think the, the, the amendment slightly misrepresents the findings. The report itself uh, said that in 2020 and 2021, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on schools was a substantial substantial additional factor. So I don't think it's reasonable to present that as though it's a reduction in active travel to school more generally. Several members mentioned uh, the uh, urban-rural uh, issues here, including Evelyn Tweed, Beatrice Wisher and others. Um, and it, it is true that for emissions reduction alone, it may be that the uh, easiest way to get that quickly is through busy routes, often in urban areas, and they can achieve high levels of modal shift. But I don't think it's enough to imagine that urban areas see active travel and, and cycling for transport uh, and emissions reduction and rural areas see it only for recreational. I don't think that's a reasonable way forward. It isn't true uh, and it doesn't recognise the demand that there is for active travel in rural areas and in smaller towns. And so I hope members will welcome the successful bids, uh, including from uh, Shetland uh, for the Active Travel Transformation Fund and from other rural and remote areas. Uh, several members uh, also mentioned their local projects, either infrastructure projects or local charities doing excellent creative uh, work to encourage active travel. I'll be happy to visit as many of these as I can. I'm a particular fan of the bike bus movement, one of the most joyful ways of encouraging and demonstrating the appetite for active travel. Um, and uh, I think John Swinney also talked about the perception of safety as well. Uh, his uh, description of, uh, of those issues of perception of safety, I can well recognise. It's one of the things that did hold me back from getting back on a bike in Glasgow was the perception uh, of safety. Uh, he was right also to say that on climate action, we are approaching the stage where very challenging tasks ahead of us uh, need to be taken if we're going to get back on track with the climate targets. And there are those who will the end, but they don't will the means. And we do need to challenge uh, that. Sometimes active travel can be polarised, sometimes opportunistically opposed, even gets caught up sometimes in the culture wars nonsense like conspiracy theories around 20-minute neighbourhoods uh, and low emission zones. So we need to ch challenge that uh, perception as well. 
Uh, I want to uh, also just finally reflect on Ben McPherson's comments about Edinburgh, uh, the, how it might have changed for the worse as a city if it had done what others did in indulging too much in the road-building obsession of the 1960s. This is what the active travel debate should be about, not just one particular bike lane on one particular route, but a long-term vision of what kind of cities, towns and communities of all sizes we want to live in in 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, and I hope that we can bring that positive vision uh, forward. It will require ongoing investment, and that is tough, uh, particularly uh, in times of heightened pressures on resources and a, a willingness to, to challenge and change the status quo. Uh, but our uh, approach to how we deliver active travel uh, is preparing the ground for the record investment that we're committing to, investment that will lead to healthier communities, generate jobs, reduce uh, costs on household budgets and revitalise local economy. I'm afraid I'm coming to the end and I, I, need, to, uh, I need to wind up. Revitalise our local economies that are, uh, in many places, still in recovery from the COVID pandemic. If we're going to ensure that we've got a fit-for-purpose delivery model for active travel to meet these challenges and capitalise on the opportunities, we have undertaken a review of our whole approach in the delivery models. The Transformation Fund is a vital first step in this, and further changes that will follow uh, are going to also require strong leadership, not only support and funding from the Scottish Government, but a strong uh, approach to working collaboratively with our delivery partners. I want to finish, Presiding Officer, by reflecting on something that Mark Ruskell said. He said that much of the progress that we're making is only possible because of a movement, a movement of people demanding change, looking to reclaim their places for people instead of for vehicles. I think that's entirely true. I don't think the Scottish Government on its own can deliver this without that community leadership that we can empower uh, around the country. So I want to finish, Presiding Officer, by encouraging uh, members to continue to engage with their local communities. Together we can ensure that the transformation of active travel reaches across Scotland and the benefits are felt in every city, town, village and household. To do that, we're going to need that joined up approach. We're going to need that working together between the Scottish Government, local authorities and communities to address all of the issues that members have mentioned and a great deal more Besides, can I once again thank members for their, their contribution to this debate and encourage members to take the opportunities that the funding increases in active travel from the Scottish Government bring to their communities and work with their communities to create that leadership and bring forward excellent projects that we can fund for the future. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on active travel transformation. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 9329 in the name of Mary McAllen on the appointment of board members to Environmental Standards Scotland. And I call on Mary McAllen to move the motion. It moves, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. And there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is the amendment 9328.2 in the name of Graeme Simpson, which seeks to amend motion 9328 in the name of Patrick Harvey on active travel transformation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.